and uh, zooms in and you guys catch up here. Uh, so we're going to start our dive today at okay. 2,358 meters. Um, there's a white line drawn around the seamount that's at 2,200 meters. Um, just so we have some context as that can be kind of a biogeogra biogeographic break uh, for the biology. Um, so our dive today there starts kind of at the bottom of that ridge um, on a relatively flatter area, so an easier landing for the ROV system. And then we'll climb up this ridge and potentially do a short dog, dog leg onto not the very top, but kind of the edge of the, the top of the feature there. Jason, would you like to, to jump in there? Punch in your uh, auto heading, please. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, as as we've been saying, this is a, a completely uh, unexplored sea mount um, based on all the records we've been uh, able to uh, uh, look at, and uh, so we don't know too much about uh, the the geology. Um, and basically, overnight, we we got our first real look at its geomorphology. Um, we're seeing I'm here that the, the western, the sorry, the eastern the flank is, is quite smooth, uh, forming this sort of continuous open slope of, uh, of similar uh, slope gradients, which is interesting. Um, and, we, you know, we'll hopefully we'll learn more about what the processes were that, that resulted in, in the formation of that, whether it was uh, continued erosion or sediment deposition uh, that has has uh, okay, so I'm gonna, impacted I'm backing uh, up. the morphology I'm there. Depth, so uh, we're hoping to see some volcanic rocks and, and, and lava flows. We've seen some really spectacular I'm ones on, on the previous dives here in the corner eyes. Um, yeah, and and if if we can, um, and we'll try, it's a, it's a long transit. I think it's about 900 meters as planned from where we land to uh, the final waypoint. Um, maybe we will get up to the top and have a poke around. I mean, one of the things we're looking for uh, on these seamounts is, is whether uh, they have a, a limestone or, or carbonate cap, which would, would tell us something about whether uh, they were closer to the uh, uh, the ocean surface uh, at some point and have subsided over time. So something we're always keeping our eyes out for yesterday's dive was, was really deep at about 4,160 meters. So definitely we didn't, we didn't see it there. Uh, we saw some good volcanic rocks there, um, but a lot to explore. And I'll get a strike. So I'm looking at my blue view to see what uphill is. See how I'm straightening this out right there. Okay, push ahead a little bit here. Great, thank you, Jason. Like a strike and thank you, Rian. Uh, do we have any for uphill? comments or suggestions from have, from those uh, on the line? Waypoint, the next waypoint. Two eight zero. Two eight zero. So we can kind and of uh, we don't have to miss straight oh. uphill. We'll just go where our nav yeah. Hi, so Kim. Um, I have a question for Jason. I, I didn't hear you say there. anything about the possibility of a, a carbonate cap on here, or did I just forward? Miss that? You can rotate up with me. Um, I, I did say it, but I don't know if anyone heard it. <laughs> I apologize. Sometimes I think I'm speaking to myself here. <laughs> we, we can uh, we can save it for uh, during the dive. I guess the bottom is in sight. So. Yep. Thank you, Scott. Depth, the bottom so is in sight, so we're going to go ahead and let the pilots get all settled in before good. we start our official dive. Thank you, everyone. Could deploy my swing arms if you wanted. My Z-Bias dialed in. Bridge, RV Nav. Good morning, Bridge. Uh, just letting you know that the vehicles have just acquired bottom. 
So it looks like we're going to be roughly moving 270-280 today on the head wall. So bailout would be 090 if that works for you guys. Good copy, and you guys can change your center of rotation to the A-frame if not already done. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. If I move your uh Can you use this? Yeah. Sure, take it. Just to put Z by style in here. So it's gonna be twenty four. Watch Lee, this is your pilot speaking. This is Watch Lee go. Hey, uh we're just finishing our uh setup over here and getting ready to get started. Those two urchins here, would you like a zoom on those? Absolutely, that okay. would be great. Let's start with that. Hey, video this pilot. I think we're going to go for the urchin first. Copy. Looks like it was on the move. I don't know. Our lights. I'll get a little bit closer video so we can get more light on it. Let us know if the lights are a little too hot or anything. Looks uh, okay at the moment. Okay. I know it's on steep terrain. It can get pretty hot. All right. Your uh, swing arms are both are all out. Copy that. Go by so good morning, fellow deep sea explorers. This is uh, Rian Waller. I am an associate professor from the University of Maine and your biology lead this morning. And I'd like to welcome you to dive six of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Expedition, North Atlantic Stepping Stones. And today we're diving on a seamount called Castle Rock in the northern end of the Cornerized Seamount area. And we're starting this dive today at 2,358 meters on a south uh, southeastern ridge um, area. And uh, as we landed here, we yeah, saw these good, two yeah. beautiful Thank sea you. urchins uh, right ahead 30 that we're zoomed deal. in on right now. Yes. Okay. This is potentially a formosoma uh, sea urchin, um, though I'm waiting to see if uh, anyone in the any of our science uh, Collaborators in the chat room uh, can help me out. And uh, these beautiful sea urchins, they're um, often found in the deep ocean. You think of urchins as having very, very hard tests, but these actually are, are quite angular. So when they are um, brought up to the surface, they kind of compress and flatten. They're a little bit softer than usual urchins. Um, and they often have these little white caps on the end of their, uh, on the end of some of their uh, spines as well. You can see all these beautiful spines and they have these little white end caps on there. Beautiful. So sea urchins are echinoderms, uh, which means that they are closely related to sea stars, brittle stars, brisingids, and uh, those and uh, and the sea lilies, which we've seen during this this research cruise a little bit. Uh, there you can see a really good shot of the little uh, white end caps on the end of their end of their spines. My lasers on. And this one is starting to move. So these sea urchins actually have two feet on the bottom that help them move, but they also sometimes use their spines as well. Yeah, they are. It's a big urchin. That is a big urchin. So those two laser dots that are on the bottom there, those are 10 centimeters apart. We use these lasers as scales, so we're able to scale organisms that live on the bottom. 
Um, as you can see, this sea urchin is uh, over 10 centimeters in diameter, so I'd say it's probably close to 12 to 15 centimeters, uh, which is a, a pretty big sea urchin, yeah, especially from the, the very start of the dive. This is a great thing to spot, and there was another one up in the right-hand corner. Um, on the seafloor here as well, just to describe a little bit of the sediment that you're seeing, uh, there are white little pteropod shells. These are actually uh, planktonic organisms, so as they die, they their shells fall to the, the seafloor. And in the left-hand side of the corner of your image there, there's actually a fossil coral. This is a fossil uh, solitary coral, coral uh, likely a Desmophyllum dianthus, and I actually see a few of them here in the sediments. Um, and these fossil corals, once they die, their skeletons stick around for hundreds of thousands of years, or hundreds of thousands of years, uh, and so can actually be used to help date seamounts and, and date uh, when different organisms are living there. And there's that second urchin up in the top corner there. And here we can see a little bit of the terrain that we landed on today's dive in. Um, kind of this rocky Maybe. area, uh, maybe some lava pillows and these little ponds of sediment in between. Video snaps of this white subject? Yeah, yeah it's set up very maybe well a it. sponge? I think it's a homothorium. Let's see. I've never seen before. That's good, Ron. Let's hold that for a second. That's, that's a really beautiful shot there. Yep, this is a, a sponge. Had confirmation from the uh, the chat room on this one too, because it's definitely, it kind of looks somewhere in between a, a sponge, a sea urchin, and a nudibranch, a sea slug. But this is uh, this is a sponge. Um, you can see it's uh, I'm moving closer, got Ron. this major pore on this um, pinnacle that's sticking out of the, the end that's slightly closer to us. And this can be very indicative of a lot of the organisms that we see in the deep ocean. Sometimes it's a little complicated to figure out what they are just from images. But this is a really beautiful specimen of this sponge. That's great, Pilot. Thank you. And you're super stable. I'd like to go in super tight. Okay, take it. You want to like something like that, Ron? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, this shot is uh, really wonderful. You can actually see, so sponges are made of um, spicules, which are give the sponge some structure. And in those little wings that are sticking up there, you can kind of see the, the patterns of the darker white spicules and the and uh, the spaces in between those spicules. And so they're um, uh, kind of knitted together to form uh, different structures. And this particular sponge looks a little bit like a hedgehog. Okay. Um, we actually don't know what the name of this sponge is, uh, but it is something that has been uh, seen before, not on this expedition, but uh, yeah, it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful specimen. Full specimen? I'll get my lasers, co pilot. See what the scale on this. Holding. Your lasers are on, I don't know. Okay. They're just, once we zoom out, we'll see them, I think. Yeah, you can see them in your, your nips. Oh, got it. Uh, yeah, it must be small enough. But, uh, a bit oh zoomed my. in for the lasers. There we are. Yeah, so about the length of this particular sponge is about 15, I'd say 12 to 15 centimeters there. And the width is about five. Beautiful. Wow, oh, that one was cool. So I've, never, I've never seen one like that before, I don't think. No, it's beautiful. It's really, uh, really pretty. I'm glad I had some confirmation from our scientists on shore, because I should say that uh, although I'm here as the uh, sole lead biologist on board, we actually have a, a great troop of uh, scientists from all over the world that are in the uh, scientific chat room here, helping us to identify organisms and seafloor features and geology uh, on the seafloor. So, pilot, this is watch lead. Go ahead, pilot. Uh, so, Go one ahead. of the Sorry. one of the first things that we'd really like to do is collect a rock from this area. So, we're looking for an angular rock right at the base here. Okay. 
Thank you. I'll keep an eye out for them. The ones in field of view, I think, are... And Rian, you're doing such a great job with the geology. I didn't actually have to chime in at all. I, I, maybe I, could... Uh, I, I've been learning. Or something. Yeah, I've, I've been uh, I've been learning, Jason, <laughs> from Oreo Great Commentary on the previous five dives. <laughs> I can just sit back and relax and and, and watch the show. <laughs> Levi, you want lasers well, on? Well, we yeah. we could use your help in picking a rock here, Jason. <laughs> okay, uh, but you know, even that, uh, you know, uh, you and the pilots and, and everyone on board are doing a pretty good job. So. Um, I mean, I'll take all the credit, but uh, you guys are doing great work. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely moving over a, a slope. Uh, I don't know, is that a, an anemone? Uh, just moving out of the center of the frame. I think that's uh, another sponge. Yep. Uh, down here. You want to snap this? Uh, yeah. but, uh, Moving over what what appears to be pillow lavas um, covered you, in this, this uh, ferromanganese crust with this petroidal grape-like texture. Yeah, a little anemone, and anemone on the anemone on your petroidal texture there. We'll keep going. We're on. Yeah, I pass biology again for today. <laughs> Always interrupted by the biology. Sorry, Jason. Always. That's all right. I don't see many but, uh, you know, so very, you know, not a whole lot different to what we uh, landed on yesterday, although there was far less sediment when we landed, and, and the relief on, on these lava, volcanic lava features uh, was certainly quite high um, as we, we, we moved uh, further upslope yesterday. We did transition into a a broad sediment plane, and you know, folks were uh, watching us yesterday, um, and we're, we're looking at the sediment. And, and Regan already mentioned it, these pteropod shells. Uh, they were definitely something we didn't see uh, in abundance yesterday. Uh, our depth uh, at about 4,200 meters put us below uh, the horizon where uh, the calcium carbonate that they are made of. Uh, is is uh, is not quite saturated in the water, so the, it's kind of corrosive. That water is corrosive to the calcium carbonate um, as a natural process. So um, we didn't see as many, but certainly today uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of pteropod shells um, within this biogenic volcaniclastic sediment. So yeah. most of the sediment is derived from uh, uh, planktonic animals that live in the water oh, column. Yeah, look. Uh, we're quite far from land, so we don't uh, get a, a huge component of material that, that comes out of rivers and um, maybe that guy by himself and off beaches and, and okay. other areas yeah. close to shore. So, uh, and, and these sediments are a good recorder of, of past oh, ocean yeah, uh, yeah. conditions. We do get some uh, some material coming from from dust storms that blow out over the ocean and, and volcanic uh, eruptions or ash falls. Uh, but the bulk of it either comes from the water or from the uh, the seaman itself. And here we came across a rock just sitting on all by itself. Monitor. This rock seems to just be hanging out all by its lonesome. Mike, give this one a try, watch the... Does this sound like a good one, Jason? Yeah, we'll, we'll give it a crush. Test. Uh, I'm not sure if it's all crust, um, but we'll give it a squeeze um, when we're trying to figure out what type of rock it is down here in in the deep sea on these these seamounts. Um, volcanic rocks tend to be much harder, where these ferromanganese crusts are are quite brittle uh, and friable. So when we squeeze them with a the manipulator, they they tend to break uh, quite easy if they are. Um, they are just ferromanganese crust. So, fortunately, we don't have rock hammers and, and other tools of geologists down here. So, uh, but we have the pilots who are who are experts at, at picking up these these kinds of uh, samples. So, we're going to let them get to work and see what we've got.
It's pretty steep here, so if I do my normal uh, finger test, I'm concerned it'll roll down the hill. So it's a pretty good grab right there, and it's holding up. It's not deforming at the fingertips. It seems nice and angular as well. It's not super thick. Um, do you still want it? See how thin that yep. is? Right, I think so. that's a keeper. Sounds like that's a, a keeper pilot. Thank you. Okay, I'll just give it a spin in front of the camera. I will just put it in the uh, starboard rock box, I guess. Okay, you can bring starboard rock box in. So these uh, samples we collect, uh, the rock samples, um, will will go back to the repository at uh, Oregon State University and become available for um, yeah, uh, scientists um, in, in the global waypoint. community to request uh, pieces for analysis. Um, we're hoping that the samples we collect here in the corner rise um, allow us to uh, determine the age of the seamount, understand something about the chemistry of the lavas that, that, that form the seamount. Which then will hopefully tell us uh, about the origin get a, uh, uh, of of the this seamount chain and whether it's related to a hotspot or or something else. Um, and the biological samples are similarly collected and processed on the ship to be sent off to the uh, Smithsonian. Um, I'd like to request the shipment, uh, again, please. Uh, range scientists one five around the world can request two eight zero degrees uh, speed zero decimal two knots. Uh, a lot of what we see is, is sometimes brand new uh, to science uh, or, or something okay, slightly different bridge. than we've seen before. So tends to be a lot of excitement about these, these samples and a lot of work to be done uh, in identifying them and, and so classifying them. Struck my curiosity. Just another sponge, maybe? Yeah, the skeleton of a sponge potentially that's been left behind. Almost exactly the same as its background. Same color. It's very, uh, very well camouflaged there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, the skeleton's kind of been infiltrated by dirt and uh, and sediment. I think that's been uh, potentially blown onto it. But you can see that the skeleton is just filled with uh, other life as well. I can see some little snails in there and some of these forams that we've been seeing on some of the sponges. Um, so even when these organisms die, they still provide habitat for other species. There's a worm tube there at the bottom as well. And you can see in the background these pteropod shells that uh, Jason had been talking about, these planktonic organisms that when they die, their um, tests or shells fall to the sea floor. You can see their little triangles or little tube shapes right now. Um, you can see some little whirly snails. Um, and this gives us a good indication of, of what the organisms are in the water column above and, and uh, that are living around this seamount, but also a little bit about that carbonate saturation horizon as well. If we were in uh, more acidic water, these pteropod shells will have worn away relatively quickly and, uh, and less so, and they'll last that little bit longer. Okay, video, come wide. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, pilot. Keep 
exploring here. We wait for the ship to move. And Is that a... I have a vase sponge over there, long tall. I'm gonna snap this. I'm just curious. Yeah. It's a little star or not. When you're ready. Yeah, you can snap it. Oh, like? there you go. <laughs> Good eyes, pilot. <laughs> what is that? This is a slime star. Ooh. Do you want a closer look? Do you want me to get closer sure, to that? Sure, okay. that would be great. Come out, video. I gotta get in here real quick. It's kind of hidden away under a rock, trying to hide from me. Zoom back in. He is in quite the tight little nook there in the rock. This uh, this crack or this this place where this rock is split in two. You see this little slime star, and this is a echinoderm, a type of starfish or sea star. Um, I actually don't know that much about slime stars, uh, other than we do see them in the in the deep ocean. There we go. So it seemed like tentacles on the end there are actually tube feet. Uh, these sea stars work with a water vascular system. So they take in water uh, through a pore, often on the top surface here that would be facing us, and use it to help them uh, move their skeleton, so move their arms and move their, their tube feet. Video is clear. Okay, yeah, come on. That's great. Thank you, pilot. Yeah. Good to have a good scan around while we're waiting Can for the, the ship move here. I think I'm starting to uh, Copy, thank you, bitch. Move. Ship's all stopped. Well, steady. You want to snag uh, a view of this one at all? It's too sponge. The sponge almost looks like it's been eaten away at the bottom. <laughs> it's got such a thin little stalk. It took about four minutes. It has a second lobe on the back there as well. Copy. So these so sponges are filter feeders, meaning they pick out the particles that they need uh, to provide them energy out of the water column. There are pores all over the surface of these sponges, and so, and they have very specialized little cells inside those pores called coanocytes, which have a little. A little wiggling flagellum in, in, in it that helps to okay. bring water through. So it draws water in, and then it comes out through that top hole or sometimes a little side hole. You can see this one has a little side lobe there. And uh, in the process of bringing that water through its structure, it filters out nutrients and food on the way. It's an interesting sponge. I couldn't tell if it was growing uh, to that thin stalk at the base or if it was on an old stalk. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. Quite that morphology. Yeah. Very unusual. Onward and upward. I'm going to pull up a little bit if that's okay. Yeah. So if we continue to move up slope, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing these uh, pillow uh, like. Uh, lava textures here, um, everything, as we've seen before, um, is uh, covered in this uh, ferromanganese crust. And here looks like a great sample to collect. Uh, <laughs> kind of off center. I, wish. I think we have room for that one. Something <laughs> off the right-hand side of that rock. Yeah, that, that I'm sure we'll find a volcanic rock in there somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think there's a rock so big enough to cut that one, Jason. Oh, we'll find one. <laughs> okay, moving around. Okay. Maybe next time. Black corals to me. <laughs> we get a bigger ROV, maybe. All right. Be hard to move that around deck. It's a science problem. Yeah. So yeah, we see these ferromanganese crusts. Uh, if you've been joining us for for. Uh, the other dives uh, in this expedition. Uh, it's something that you'll hear us say, or you've heard us say quite often, and uh, we'll no doubt continue to say it for uh, most, if not all, the rest uh, of of, uh, of the dives. Uh, this uh, this mineral crust uh, precipitates out of the water column, 
uh, accumulating extremely slowly uh, at, a, at a rate of about one millimeter per year. Uh, it it uh, is is you know kind of pervasive. Uh, any exposed uh, get 15, you know, moderately yeah. hard substrate, yeah, right. and, and we've seen uh, not really. Uh, too much uh, like to another move in, on please. this dive, but Range one, five meters, uh, even two, eight, zero. coral skeletons will, uh, if they're exposed knots. on the seafloor for long enough, they will begin to get this uh, this mineral precipitate uh, coating them as well. So um, we say ferromanganese it, it's, uh, because the, the primary mineral constituents are iron and manganese, and that's what the manganese gives it this. Uh, yeah, the, guy. This black the color, yeah. uh, the iron, if Come we in. tend to oh, see it, is usually a more rusty color uh, because it, it essentially is rust. Um, similar shape to that one that was um, now the sponge. back there, isn't it? Beautiful. Yeah, this is a very similar shape. Oh, oh I might have a picnogonid on it. Let's see. Get a better view. It looks a bit thick for a picnogonid, actually. So it looks like the sponge we were imaging a few minutes ago that was dead. It right. does. It does. Scott, do you see the potential uh, picnogonid on it, or maybe it's yeah, not? I'm looking at it. Maybe. I, I haven't seen one quite like this in no. before, if that's what it is. Looks almost like algae. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it is just a piece of algae that's come down to the deep ocean and is caught on here. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah, it's like it has legs. Yep. Yeah, I mean, in shallow water, the uh, picnogonids, the sea spiders, do have lots of processes coming out the leg and bristles and so on. But the deep sea ones tend to be pretty smooth. Yep. At least in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, but this definitely looks, it's got that very similar structure to that sponge that we just were looking at that was dead. So this is what one looks like when it's alive. You can again see that that uh, that structure, that silica structure. So these are glass sponges. So their silica, their spicules are made out of silica, all knitted together to form these beautiful, beautiful structures. Specimen. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And a mass of those pteropod shells behind there. Do you see that, Jason? Clear. Yeah, I was just about to uh, to comment on the extremely coarse uh, nature of the sediment and. Um, what we, we do see is, is these rocks, the crevices in between the rocks often form these uh, almost like riffles that you see uh, um, people use to, you know, uh, uh, separate different uh, sediment types, um, causes the flow to kind of slow down um, and, and, and drop out these, these materials. Yeah. So. Oh, stand, sure. um, it's certainly, certainly a lot different to what we saw yesterday. So it speaks to that, uh, that to float here. Uh, carbonate that. saturation horizon. Take a little more. Float, oh, here we're seeing some of that rust color I was talking about. Um, essentially, it is, it is a, uh, this might be an area where there had previously been a, a thicker crust and it broke away, exposing uh, material underneath that... Uh, you know, on contact with the seawater uh, and the oxygen in the seawater, the iron began uh, to oxidize, just like rust on, on that we see on land. You know, so under there is, is the primary volcanic uh, rock uh, that that forms this seamount. Um, still hard to tell, uh, you know, if if we're actually seeing that primary structure, but. Uh, that's a great zoom. Okay. It's a really, really complex interplay of, of ocean chemistry and and uh, the you know the substrate, you know, forming these, uh, these you know really pervasive crusts, and we can see it all these these bubbly oh grape-like textures uh, are these crusts. And, and they are they're excellent recorders of, of changes in uh, you know or, or large scale changes in water chemistry over time. Uh, they also are you know contain a lot of different minerals. Um, you know more that? than just the iron and the manganese. Yeah. 
and they form they, they, they appear to form great places for a lot of these uh, sessile organisms to land and and grow um, all right ship should just be about all stop yeah yeah I'll go for the crinoid looking subject looks like possibly a crinoid here on the side of the rock and a sponge below it Okay, yeah, a crinoid. So this is um, a crinoid a without a stalk. We've seen a couple of stalked crino crinoids. Stop, We've seen a few of these yeah. ones without stalks too. I think the stalk crinoid from the other day really sticks in your brain because it was uh, like this beautiful deep red color. Um, but this is a crinoid without a stalk. They have uh, instead little legs that help uh, hold them onto the surface. They're again relatives of the sea stars and uh, and uh, urchins. They they belong to the Echinodermata. And they have all these pinules okay. going down their arms there. Yeah, they're uh, so guy caught my eye. busy there picking particles out of the water. We can see that there's a lot of particles in this water. Snap it. Do you see the worm on the rock? And yep. there's Over left. one of these stalks to stalk sponges here. It's kind of difficult to get a grasp of his geometry. This looks like a ball, doesn't it? I'm going to uh, keep pulling up as I swing closer. Sounds good. The you can come out. Roll it's out a type of euplectelid, potentially. There's something else on the rock. You yeah. that circle upper left. Yeah, potentially another sponge up in that upper left, if that's where you're looking, pilot. Let's look at the circle. You can snap it, Rowan. Yeah. What's that? Oh. Oh, that's a yeah, <laughs> pterapod or something. No, it's um. Could be star next to it. Oh, and a little oh, sea yeah. star there as Got well. It. Make steady up, uh, It's there are chitons, a uh, type of chiton. Thank you, Scott, for reminding me there. Um, I'll try to hold that, Ron, for just a second. That's a small Isn't star. That's a very tiny that's little sea star. Zoom. <laughs> and chitons are not very large either. Sorry. I was no. just going to say, I, I'm always fascinated when we see them here, but uh, you're probably going to explain why. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Scott. You're on. I, well, I was just going to say that these are very common in um, wave-swept intertidal zones, rocky intertidal zones, and they're well adapted for, you know, hanging onto the rock, creating some suction when the waves are crashing over them, and they uh, they graze over the rock, so they'd be scra uh, scraping algae off it and so on. But down here, you know, we don't see that wave action. Um, my hypothesis, I guess, would be that this is something that evolved in shallow water and subsequently moved into the deep sea, so it still has that general morphology, but uh, you don't see the strong currents. But you can see sure. all that rock that's cleared around it. I wonder oh, if it's been moving wrong. around there, yeah, kind of maybe yeah. bacteria form a different stuff. This is our rock. port light bank. Yeah, and these chitons are mollusks, so they uh, are related to the snails, Come on right up. and so they have a specialized right. radula, which is what uh, clears that surface. You can almost see the little teeth like marks that. of the radula behind the chitin there. And yeah, there's a little polychaete worm here as well. It's always amazing when you really zoom into areas and, and get a really good look, and that's one of the huge benefits of the D2 system. It just has such good cameras that we can zoom right in and see this, uh, this tiny polychaete on the left-hand side that's crawling along the rock here. Here it goes. Um, I mean, this this polychaete is probably only a few centimeters long, and, and here we are being able to look at it at uh, 2,300 meters depth uh, in the seafloor. Yeah, and actually, that's a really good view. You can see those teeth mark of the chitons. So they, they have this specialized radula, which is a tooth that helps them scrape rocks specifically and be able to get all that bacteria and in the upper surface uh, algae and things out. like that on the on the rock. You can I'll see try, its trail. I'm trying to grab a fish. That's really nice. Thank you so much, pilot. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I believe it's a calcium carbonate with a protein. Maybe uh, Scott might know more on that one. He's hiding from me. It's up above my uppers. Let go. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. I have the uh, pilot on. The, um, the tooth of the radula, do we know what that's made out of? It's a very, very hard material. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, I believe that's uh, protonaceous. Um, hmm. Maybe my uh, my student James Aubrey worked on um, mollusks for his master's degree. Maybe he could uh, add some stuff in the chat about it. He did a lot of work with radula.
pilots want another 15? Uh, just, yeah. Yep. Good for it. want to keep moving. Bridge RV down. Hi, Bridge. I'd like to put another ship move in, please. Range 15 meters, bearing 280, speed 0 decimal 2 knots. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. I'm coming up. You can come up with me. That rock just has interesting nodules. Hmm. Keep going. Onward and upward. Seeing a lot of large broken uh, pieces of this uh, rock, perhaps more than we've seen on most uh, most slopes that we've uh, been traversing up so far uh, on this expedition. One of the things we noted with the bathymetry that the, the mapping team did a great job of collecting overnight was the the the, the eastern side of the seamount is the particularly spot. smooth. Uh, at, at, a, at a broad scale, obviously, <laughs> when we look at it with D2's cameras, it doesn't look uh, smooth. But um, that kind of uh, Watch later, uh, now. you know lack of relief that we would see on the bathymetry maps uh, sometimes uh, indicates that uh, the flanks of of, of the seamount may have been eroding uh, uh, no uh, quite Just extensively. Just wanted to confirm science uh, targets today, so, so we, we don't actually uh, see we're this. We're on our way to uh, waypoint two, about 350 uh, meters. Rugged terrain. Waypoint three is at the arms, top of the uh, mound here. Is that know, a hard target uh, for you guys to so make sure and, we make that? Or debris channels that, that we, we often a, see. Uh, so it's objective today. Interesting as we continue up, whether we can, we you know, see a lot of this uh, displaced material. Good copy. Thank you, Welsh. And ultimately, the some areas where where things uh, uh, appear to be more massive and, and in place. 1420. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, video, you can come in. Another Desmo film uh, skeleton there. Got and a sponge. It's got a couple little uh, associates hanging out with him. Oh, yeah, there's some little as an uh, potential amphipod on the bottom of there. Not quite sure what the other one is. Yeah, target today. Yeah, waving around in the uh, in the current there. You can uh, see really clearly on the lower one like, uh, amphipod eyes. Yeah, I think they're both amphipods. You're just looking at a different angle. The upper one. Um, is you're looking at the dorsal side, the back side, and the lower one, you're seeing its ventral and face view. Okay. Next video. Okay. Keep going here. I think I'm starting to get a little close to close side so I pull up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I'm coming up as well. Perfect. Just gonna scout to my port with my sonar system. Pretty hard return on serial, so I'm just going to check it out. Yeah, normal slope. Okay. Dark section over there. Yeah, so if you've just joined us today, I'd like to say welcome to Dive 6 of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Expedition, the North Atlantic Stepping Stones. And today we're diving on uh, Castle Rock, uh, which is in the northern end of the Corner Rise Seamounts. 
Uh, we are up. diving at a site around 2,358 meters stop. depth. Okay. Uh, we're currently at 2,300 meters. We've come up just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we're I'm working our way close. up a fairly yeah. steep uh, face uh, on the southeastern corner <laughs> of this particular seat mount. And it looks like we've just come up to a kind of a steeper, steeper area here. Closer to you. If you want to haul in on the winch. Okay. You can haul in a little quicker. There you go. Come up with you. So well, actually, there's a pretty large cliff to our port side. So we're actually going to come up pretty fast. If you want to come up, Anya, you're inside the 12 meter circle. We need to, we need to come up. There you go. You want me to stop? Yeah. We should be stopped. Bridge, are we now? Hey, can we call for easy stop, please? You want me to come back, Levi? Yeah. Bridge, are we now? To rotate down. Uh, yes, we'd like to call for a ship move, please. Range one zero meters, bearing one two zero, speed zero decimal two knots. Here we go. If you switch your live stream to uh, live stream three Good right copy. now, you can see in one of those panes is the pilot's sonar, right. which tells Coming us what is up meters. ahead of us. That's good. We're over it now. And yeah. where you see bright targets, it means there are hard targets, often steep faces or rocks. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing here right now. Yeah, watch it. So what happened was there's a pretty large cliff to our port side. It was pretty much straight up. So we kind of came right up just to stay in a safe configuration. That's great. Thank you, pilot. So the pilots were just saying if, uh, that they came across a very steep face and so just had to back off a little bit to, to maintain safety and now are coming back in there. Oh, and there's an Iridia Gorgia. I think that's the first one of this uh, this cruise so far. Wow, look how big those are. Yeah. Some lasers on that would be great pilot. Yeah, they're out there, the lasers. Oh, and there's two of them. There's one in the background, too. So there's one in the foreground and one in the background. I love these octocarls. They're just so beautiful. Um, they're called Iridogorgia mega spiralis. Um, for fairly obvious reasons, they form these major spirals. And they're really tall. There are the lasers. You can just about see them. They're 10 centimeters apart. So those red dots are what we use to scale organisms on the seafloor. And so this uh, this particular coral, which I believe is the shorter of the two that we can see in this frame, that is, a cool coral. Uh, is probably at least a couple of meters high. And uh, Scott Franz says there's actually a third one in the background there too. So this must be a, a good area for their larvae to settle and, and grow on this steep face. And we are at uh, 2,276 meters right now. So we just made a uh, about a 25 meter hop uh, up onto this wall. Beautiful. Wow. So, Rian, just to uh, clarify, there's a different come species the... behind these two Ritigorgia. Oh, okay. That, that <laughs> yep. More species around the corner. Good spot. Yep. The uh, I think it's the Ritigorgia that have that been uh, uh, not. I don't. Maybe it's a species. Uh, Les Watling should chime in to uh, well, verify this. But, uh, uh, the tallest known uh, or the longest ago. known octocoral, I believe, is an Ritigorgia. And that was, um, I'm pretty sure, more than five meters tall. In the wow. I, c I can believe it. These uh, Ritigorgia are so tall and dwarf uh, a lot of the other coral species that we see. Kind of floating here, Roland. So. One thing that's interesting is they're in the family Chrysogorgiaidae, and we have been seeing the odd Chrysogorgia colony over the past several dives. Uh, not a whole lot of them. I suspect we'll see more as we go forward. But all oh, of the you want easy that, stop? Um, yeah. That Bridge, are we now? Have this interesting hey, Bridge, can we have an easy stop, please? To them, and they're usually Good copy. Um, Thank you, quite specific in the angle of branching. And right, the Ritigorgia nice stop. they have those smooth curves that you described earlier. Just so beautiful to look at. Very hypnotizing. Very, very much. It would be great to take a look at that second one, too, pilot, and, and head over in that direction if there are more corals that way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Go ahead, Bridge. Copy. Thank you, Bridge. All right. Ships on stop pilots. If I remember right. rightly, too, Scott, that when you uh, collect the, the, a piece of the skeleton of this uh, particular species, it's uh, shiny as well. Is that is that correct? Am I thinking of the right one? Right. I'm going to shift my heading a little bit to give you more central. That's good. Yeah, I think they, they all have a somewhat iridescent yeah. skeleton. Yeah. Um, and most of the Chrysogorgiids, the skeleton is uh, is kind of gold um, in nature. It doesn't have that iridescent the spiral. I think there's one like group that may have a dark skull. Metallogorgia, but otherwise, yeah. 
beautiful to look at in all kinds of ways. Really beautiful. You can see all the polyps are aligned along one face of the branch. Very delicate. Very delicate. You can see some of them closing up their tentacles there. Yeah, exceedingly thin layer of tissue on the uh, branches, the skeleton oh, yeah. itself. Look at that. Oh, really gorgeous. And what's remarkable is all these polyps are interconnected with Science, each other. you guys see those streamers? I see what you did there. Those are there is some a, other creatures, aren't they? continuous tube that links all of their digestive spaces. Where are they coming from, Rolf? Uh, it's amazing what you can do in miniature. Uh, associates. I was just commenting that, can you guys see the streamers that are coming from those uh, other yellow creatures on that uh, stem? Cool. Okay. Pilot's clear. Thanks, Roland. I had not noticed that, so yeah, let me try to find that. I see them, Roland. Really fine looking filaments. Yeah, I think they're coming off kind of the central branch right now. You can see some of the polyps are right. interrupted by these orange. Oh, yeah. uh, I assume it's a benthic tenophore, potentially. They tend to have these large stringers. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I see uh, two, maybe two or three of them lined up. I mean, the alternative explanation there is it's some kind of unusual tentacle arising from a modified polyp, but I think that the benthic tenophores is much more likely. Really it, small ones. When I first saw it, I actually thought maybe it was uh, it was slime. A lot of these corals can produce slime in reaction yeah. to a predator, but uh, but yeah, there are yellow uh, yellow infiltrators on that branch Perfect. there. Beautiful. I always rely on Roland finding that small detail. Yeah. Nice <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Roland. Okay, pilot's clear. Try to check out that other species. They wanted to see the other specimen. It actually looks like there might be another one down at the base of this one. Potentially as well. You can just see those beautiful mega wide. spirals okay. of the skeleton. Very different from anything we've seen so far in this expedition where the corals are either these beautiful fan shapes or straight up and down whip corals. These are Iridogorgia mega spiralis. They're definitely mega. Okay, Washley, what was the next one you wanted to see? I actually think if you pan down a little bit on this rock, I think there's actually a, a little one. We don't need a super long zoom on it. If it is, oh, no, it's a little bathypathies. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, a black coral sitting at the base here. I know that's an awkward angle, so. There's another uh, kind of that one, too. Oh, a little crinoid. Little crinoid yeah. There's all kinds of things on this rock. Yeah. Cool. This is, uh, must be a productive area where there must be a lot of food uh, in the water to be able to sustain these different coral species. Or maybe not a lot, but more than other areas. Give you a pirouette, Roland. Copy pirouette. Is this a good distance? Yep, just in colors. As I saddle over to the other colony. Wow, it's like mesmerizing the spiral. It really is. Yeah. It's uh, it's beautiful. I always love looking at them. And all of the branches sticking up into the water column. Cool. So yeah. these corals are colonies. Each of those uh, little polyps that we're seeing were little individuals, but they're all genetically identical to one another. They're produced along the skeleton as the skeleton grows. Really beautiful. Come down for this uh, other colony here. A full wide video. You are. Oh, and there's a couple more bathypathies, black corals there. And here's this other colony of uh, Iridogorgia. And this one had a really long stem on the bottom, if I remember, too. Yeah, look at yeah, that. Look at that. These are such large colonies. I keep asking my video to come full wide, but we are. <laughs> yeah, Go with laser hard to capture on. one picture. And it looks like there's a, a juvenile one to the left of it too, just uh, entering the the screen there. Yeah, this is just wonderful, beautiful. Okay. 
to do some. Yeah, and then we have a different species down here. I'm not sure if this is a bamboo or primnoid grill. If we can take a zoom on this one whenever you're ready. Yeah. And some sponges there as well. I see more of these yellow crinoids uh, that we've been seeing a little bit through this dive. Oh, and on the wall face too, there are actually all these fossil cup corals. You can see there. Come in partial video. Little downward partial facing video. triangles gives them away. to get an ID on this one. Probably won't get a beautiful shot. It's kind of below me. On approach, this looks like an Isodella bamboo coral. Yeah. Try to get the branching nodes. It is. It would have nodes at the branches. Yeah, if you're listening to the pilot, they're already looking for branching nodes for you, Scott. They've been trained well. Nice. <laughs> All very well trained. Wonderful. <laughs> I got you, Scott. Hey, it's only if they want to know the name. If they just want well, Bamboo Coral, we can just move on. Uh, the <laughs> just so we could have Beautiful. On you know, this it's interesting. Sure. I don't the see nose. Kind of yeah, the tissue is relatively thick. It's opaque. Oh, there's one. There's a lot of yeah, that know, like bottom. sclerites in there making it hard to see. Yeah, I see there's one. So I can't tell if that's at the node or just below. It looks like the branches are coming just after. Yeah, just after, just above. I see three in this image, four in this image. Yeah, and they're all just above that node. And what we're talking about here are these black areas on this coral skeleton. Um, this is what gives the bamboo coral its name, makes it look a little like bamboo. So the main coral skeleton is made out of a calcium carbonate, and then it has these protonaceous, these black nodes at different areas along the, uh, along the coral skeleton. And they're actually used for taxonomy. So, so. My okay, thanks, video. Go, go ahead, Scott. Yep, I yep, no problem. Um, I retract my identification of Isodella. This is not an Isodella. Ah. Okay. Nice view. Thank you. Like, is this a crinoid hanging out on this sponge or a persingid? Take it wrong. Yeah. Oh, it's two crinoids. Ah. Or is it? Is it two? It's, kind of, it's arms are going in all different directions there. It's actually hard to tell whether it's one or two. I try to spin this diver here. Ah. I think it might just be one, just with a yeah. jumble, jumble of arms blowing in the current there. Thank you. Oh, yeah. looks like there's another stalkless one below as well of a different species. You can see those different colors and slightly uh, thinner, thinner arms. Thanks, video. Thank you. And we got another coral above those two orange ones. Okay. Oh. Is that an Achenella? So right on the top of these two bright red, there's kind of a yellowy red coral. Okay, I'll we'll go there. for that next. It's still ironic. I can get a left toe down and then I can get a uh, better shot for you. Yep, as close as you get to it. Looks like it's very small polyps. Okay. Okay, take it. It's interesting, this is a mostly dead specimen here. It's got a brittle star up in the top corner. I'll start with the polyps, then we'll go to brittle. I can see little amphipods in the skeleton too. I'm looking out for a predator to see what might be eating this Chrysogorgia. Got any more zoom? That's Max. Max zoom, copy. Hold this for a second, and then we can move up to the brittle. Is that a brittle? Is that a star there left? This center? is a really good example, actually, of that shiny skeleton. You can see it has just a little bit of iridescence to it where the polyps are missing. Exactly. Quite a few of these. So I'm, uh, I see Chris Kelly's on the line. I'm wondering, I, I don't recall ever seeing a sea star on a Chrysogorgian. Um, There's something very center of the screen. Too small he has. To but really 
to uh, turn down. Maple coffer and worms would right. be more likely, yeah. I think, as something that would be stripping all the live yeah, tissue off so, of this. Or, I don't know. Schmitz. Yeah, I can't quite see what's uh, stripping the tissue, but the um, brittle serrow was in an area without any tissue, so it is potentially just using the, the structure there. Yeah, that's what I would predict. I, I think these chrysogorosia are pretty good at producing secondary chemicals to, um, you know, that are noxious. Other things don't settle on them all that much. What are you going for, pilot? So when there is no tissue, then things will take advantage of the matrix of the skeleton. Yep, absolutely. Apicophron worm. It's apicophron worm-like. Worm-like. That's right. <laughs> worm-like mollusks. Yeah, and there's a crinoid up in here as well. Push into the white object on the lower left. Oh, another one of those packets. A very small one, yeah. Huh, okay. Little amphipods in there. Thank you so much, pilot. Yeah. This is great. Keep going, Roland. Onward, upward. to really change the seafloor morphology here where we came from those pillow boulders with the sediment and now we're kind of on the steep face and already we found uh, one, two, three, three species of coral uh, on this face. And the reason that these corals often are found on these steep faces is that's often an area where water flow is increased. So as the water flow increases, that's how food gets in. And so these uh, organisms that are picking particles out of the water to feed uh, tend to flourish there. And that uh, that area down below is obviously a, a great place for the, the larvae of these aridogorgia to, to settle and grow. It must be just a, a great spot along that wall. Potentially another chrysogorgia here coming up in the middle. It'd be great to have a snap zoom on that pilot. Yeah, a video can snap the possible chrysogorgia. Yeah. A little, one of those rust spots too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and a more recent dead Yeah, couple. I wonder if those are... I wonder if those are areas where something has been attached, uh, you know, either a sponge or a, or a coral base or something else that, uh, you know, has stripped part of the, the, the ferromanganese coating off or, or at least uh, allowed oxidation to happen. It's, it's uh, interesting that they kind of form that sort of oval, elongated shape. But that's in a live desmo right there, right next to it. Where are they looking? A little shrimp in the middle there, Jason. Is that what you see? I'm getting closer, Roland. No, I thought I saw a, 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 a cup coral next yes. to the rust Yes, so that's a, a cup coral. It's a it's a dead cup coral, but a, rel a more recently dead cup coral because it hasn't yet had time to cover over in that. Um, uh, with that manganese oxide, it started to turn a brown color. So when these are alive or really recently dead, they would be bright white. I was going to throw in there while we were looking at the shrimp. It's a bit late, but um, very often when we Come see the video. shrimp in the Chrysogorgia, um, they're females with eggs, and we're wondering if they're hanging out here, sort of protecting their eggs. Oh, interesting. There might be a sea cucumber there. Uh, to the right of the Chrysogorgia, there's something white between yeah. the sponge and the Chrysogorgia. Oh, yeah, actually, might, yes, yep, I think that's a sea cucumber Let's on the it. rocks there. Yes, please. Thank you. Hold on. Uh, and this might be another swimming species of sea cucumber. I'm not sure. It just, it seems to have, um, some of these sea cucumbers are ones that uh, really stick to the seafloor, and others have kind of swimming appendages at one end where they're kind of laterally flattened. And that looks a little like what that is, like a hood on the top there. You can see the tube feet there, slightly off of the rock. It slipped a little bit. Yeah. Back with you. <laughs> so these sea cucumbers uh, ingest, uh, ingest sediment. And that sediment, uh, they, they oh, get all yeah. the nutrients out of that sediment by having a very long gut system. And as the, the sediment moves through that gut, it pulls out uh, all of the, 
the good nutrients and good food, and then the waste comes out the other end. Uh, I think this might be an L-pitted uh, type of sea cucumber from Christopher Kelly, um, which are uh, a, a type of swimming swimming sea cucumber, potentially. Not swimming today, hanging out on the sea floor, maybe getting a snack. Up on the upper left, is that a sea urchin, that bulbous thing, or is that a sponge? On that dead sponge stock. It looks like another sponge, potentially, but we should uh, maybe have a quick snap zoom on yeah. the, the dead. Video come in on the yeah, it looks like oh. an interesting sea star, too. Yeah. Yeah, so this is another persingid. Ah, oh, and there's another coral skeleton right in the middle. And that one very distinctively looks like a, a Desmophyllum dianthus. I don't know. Can we get in any closer there, or yeah. are we at full? One second. I potentially see a little bit of red tissue in there. It's probably not reacting very well to having that sea star, and uh, I think that's a sponge uh, on the top there. Okay. There's other little brittle stars. You can see the stalk of the sponge, just like we were talking about earlier, um, is just covered with life. There's all small. kinds of things living on here. Yeah, there are these uh, yep. uh, sea lilies. Uh, we have some hydroids. We have other live sponges. We have that cup coral in the center there, and that's sclerotinian hard coral. And then we have this bersingid here. Let's go with the cup coral. And as noted in the chat room that this bowl kind of sitting on the top is very unusual. I think it's potentially a, a sponge with uh, very long spikes. Don't see it moving around. I don't see two feet like a sea urchin, but boy, that's the spikiest sponge I think I've ever seen. <laughs> really beautiful. Looks like a pom-pom sitting on top of this, uh, uh, this, car this um, sponge skeleton, a little pom-pom. A dangerous pom-pom. A dangerous pom-pom, <laughs> yep. You wouldn't want to mess with that pom-pom. <laughs> yeah, there's even some little mollusks in there as well as some barnacles. Just absolutely covered with life, this one little stalk of, of dead uh, dead sponge. And just panning down a little bit. There's our cup coral. So in full disclosure, I did my PhD and much of my postdoc on these cup corals, and so I have a little bit of an affinity for them. I get very excited when I see one. Um, so this is a Desmophyllum dianthus. It is alive. I can see some red tissue on the inside there, though its tentacles are not out right now. Um, but I always get excited when I see these cup corals. That beautiful brisingid there. You can see those spines sticking out of the sea star. Interesting that those thick lumps that you might be wondering what those are on the arms, those are actually the gonads, and so that's where uh, they make eggs and sperm uh, in the sea star. Pulling out full wide. Beautiful shot. Thank you so much, pilot. Yeah. Ready for a move? Go out. Yeah, I'm all clear okay. here. Probably get 15. All right, let's get back on it. It's video. Do we want to keep, I guess, what angle do we, or bearing are we looking at? You're at 260. Yes. Two. Uh, where were you at, Levi, when you were headed up on that? It's always fun as a deep sea biologist yeah. to see these associations that uh, before we really had the technology to bring cameras down to the sea floor that of this higher bridge quality, we had no idea would happen. You know, most samples would be done hey, by very small dredges or small trolls or grab samples, meters, and you'd end up with this mix of animals, and you didn't really know who was minutes. living with who, and this technology to be able to bring cameras down and actually look around and look, look in cracks and crevices has really Thank you, pushed forward the field of, of deep sea biology. Um, and now we can do these telepresence cruises like this one today where we can actually involve scientists from all over the globe. I'm looking at a list of 20 scientists or so here from uh, from all over the world. We have from Japan and England and, and uh, various coasts of the US, uh, Russia, uh, all these scientists here are helping me today uh, to narrate to you what we're seeing on the seafloor. And here we have a crinoid on a stalk, a stalk crinoid, frame it up. and another one of these bathypathies black corals in the, in the foreground, yeah. too. We'll just spin around them. 
Won't take a lot of time. But. There were two of these stalk crinoids uh, in this area. Beautiful yellow color on this one. We've had red, white, and yellow so far of these crinoids, these sea lilies. The truffy the trees. Okay, I'll let it go. Video. Got a move in. On burn upward. Move is in. The black coral. It looks a little like we're coming off of the steep face now and getting a, a little bit uh, less of a, a slope here. But we're still seeing some of these corals. I see another Pathy Pathy's black coral there. Oh, and here are some sponges. Exploratory search here for safety. Look at that. What do we have up there? It's a big sponge. That is a big sponge. There it is, Rowan. Rowan, video engineer, revealing the unknown to us. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Video engineer just turned on the lights up a little bit so we could see this ridge that's ahead of us. And there he's... Uh, like to keep a little for surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pilots like to reduce surprise. Yeah, this is also really great viewing of just how much we don't really see while um, surrounding in D2, but with the new sonars that, uh, the blue view sonars that have been attached to D2, which you can see on your video stream three, um, we're able to detect, or the pilots are able to detect um, well in advance what kind of features we're approaching using that sonar in order to better estimate the better moves or how they can navigate around uh, these large features that maybe the light doesn't always catch or we can't see as quickly as uh, the sonars can detect. Oh, and that sponge looks like it also has a red crinoid on it. It does. You can it snap does. the crinoid and then I'll go for the more photogenic sponge to our left. <laughs> Yeah. This crinoid actually looks like it's it has a bit of a barnacle here. on it too. On that bottom bottom quadrant. Yeah, and something um, broke off part of its arms. A little squat lobster there. You come out video, that's good. Watch it, do you need a closer look at this one or would you like me to move to the one to our port? Uh, we're actually debating uh, potentially collecting a little bit of one of these sponges. Um, okay. There is uh, a debate about the species, the and it, we're, right? we're not sure. You agree? Yeah. What species these are? Okay, Bridge. See the white sea star. Copy. Thank you, Bridge. There, we are all stop. It oh, looks like there are some lepidisis bamboo whip corals up here. Oh no, actually, mega spiralis. I'm sorry, Eridogorgia mega spiralis. Okay, I'm just going to look at this bunch to our port, and then I'll move on that to our star over here. Oh, this one too, it also has uh, some crinoids on it as well. Interesting geology here too, it's like pillowy pillowy and then kind of rugged on this face. Like it may have broke away or something. For those on... Um, that can't hear the pilots, the pilot just stated that the geology seems to be changing, and that's actually quite right. What we're seeing here is that on top, there's like a so pillow yeah, lava so feature where we're yeah. going up this very steep slope at the moment, and you're seeing some uh, petroidal material, and that actually forms from the ferromanganese encrusting over potentially millions of years, depending how the, on the thickness crust. of the crusting yeah, that's so occurring on uh, what is likely this basaltic there. rock here. Yeah, there's an interesting kind of line. Can we zoom for that line? Yeah, you can spray yeah it and it's almost like a different layer that comes um, when the well, lava that, flow potentially go. settled. You, we see this coming in in different kinds of layers potentially. Um, if it cools at different times, and then another potential submerged eruption occurred, lava can ooze out and flow down in, in uh, varying layers. And this is actually really interesting because if you see these general cracks here, that means that there's water inflow through these systems, and um, that means that it's also it's likely that within those it's areas, the there's ferromanganese encrusting as well. Thank you, pilot. Yeah. I'm gonna frame up the, actually it's pretty well framed up, but just hold that for a second.
No, I think we're done with lasers. Very interesting morphology on this one. I might just go pirouette and keep moving around. How do you yep. Does that sound good? Following you. It's just partial. Just come to port. Come to port. Quarter spin here. Quite the sponge, isn't it? There's some yellow things in the top and center. Pilot, this is Watch Lee 2. Go ahead. Would it be possible to potentially take a sample of the sponge that might have a crinoid attached to it? But it, the crinoid will likely swim away, but if it's possible. Yeah, there's an interest in both a sample of the crinoid and a sample of the sponge. Okay, so we pick a branch. So if we can be advantageous and get a twofer, even though it's not usually likely. Okay. I'm just going to pick a branch here. And if they can go in two different boxes, that's great. And if they can't, that's that's fine. Here we go wide. You can also do one back. Um, crinoid. Yeah, the looking back. at the the video, um, you know, what we might be seeing here, and, and Kim was, was was spot on with, we're seeing, definitely seeing some some flow layering, um, and what we may actually be seeing on this more vertical face is, is the flow front. So uh, this uh, material uh, erupted and flowed down, and uh, eventually they stop. Um, and uh, you know, when it stops, it, it kind of forms this, this wall, this, this front of the flows. So, um, you know, the other, the other possibility is, you know, we're, we've cut down a section through the volcanic flows. Part of the, uh, the seamount flank here is, has broken off and uh, fallen down slope as a, a debris flow or a little landslide. So what we set up on these, with these sponges, uh, lots of interesting geology to see too. I got hydraulics up. Yep. Please. Can I take your monitor? Yeah. See the one in the back? Take the one in the back. And then to draw out in this situation, um, what you can do is starboard wing inboard, and that might buy you a little more draw mm -hmm. out. And if we still hit the side, then I can take off while having it do kind of a floating stow. Got Potentially. So, just be ready for that. Okay, looks like you have hydraulics up. I might turn the RPMs up. Uh, 1400. And then, because there's a crinoid, I do port side. So, if you want to get ready for a port bio box action. And then keep an eye on D2. So I have my right toe sitting down, and I joy locked in some down and some starboard and auto heading. So what could potentially happen is sliding off of the rock. So if you see me start, if my toe starts sliding, let me know, okay? Copy. All right, so I'm going to get my grip force way down here. And I think I'm going to try cutting it with the uh, coral cutters, and then the tag on should potentially hold it. Hopefully the um, it's not too brittle. I don't, it might just like crumble and fall apart. Would be the be the failure mode here. Full squat lobster hanging out. <laughs> so I'm just gonna center it up on Mini Zeus. If you can zoom in on Mini Zeus, so I can understand better the geometry of what I'm dealing with here. Let's see how far down this, uh, sometimes you can get credits to, uh, grab onto your manipulator jaws, too. Looks a little too thick past the arm fingertips. I think I can, um... Might end up ripping or tearing part of it, but we'll see. I 
Good cut. Very nicely done. Zoom out, please. So now the hard part is going to be keeping the crinoids in play. So if you could starboard wing inboard. Yes. So it's starting to tear out of my jaw. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring it very carefully over where I think the bio box is going to be. You said starboard or did you mean port? So she's bringing the starboard uh, wing inboard so that way we can draw out in this position. Oh, so I'm just going to, if you could see there very carefully. All right. Want you to extend the drawer? Yeah. So what you need to do oh. is you need to retract the drawer, extend the port bio pin, and then extend the drawer, and then the, and then it should be ready. All right. Easy, easy. Okay. Watch it. I think they might end up in the same box, but we'll see. That's good. That's good. That is really no problem if that happens. Okay. too much, Seems pretty light and airy. Try to uh, I think it's coming off. Might have to knock it in. Yeah, it came off. Might draw in slightly to push it in. Yeah, it looks good, Levi. Nice job. Well done. Well done. Well Violet. done. We're all holding Whoa. our breath back here. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. Well done. <laughs> Thank you for that sample. No problem. Back outboard. Okay. Good. Right. Hydraulics disabled. Hydraulics disabled. And I'm going to bring my camera back. Okay. So. Taking off. After that really excellent sample collection, there's been uh, some discussion in the chat room about whether why these feather stars didn't swim away. You know, very often we see feather stars swimming through the water column. And uh, Charles Messing uh, commented that not all feather stars actually swim. Um, but uh, even he was a little surprised that these ones did not swim away. So that was a uh, really gently and, and well done to the pilots up front here. We're seeing an Iridogorgia megaspiralis in front of us. And actually the, uh, the base of this one has been colonized over. See some hydroids and potentially some barnacles and things covering the, the base of this one. So this looks like the top pilot. This looks like we're seeing them right over the top now. Okay. We see again they've uh, they've taken advantage of, of this more vertical wall where either material has, has eroded off or uh, fallen off as, as part of a a small collapse or or we see. You know, formation of a, a flow front and a vertical wall. So, it's a um, to the next get every you know, the animals you know, take advantage and get out into zero, the into the flowing something current. Something like and you know, sediment you know kind of accumulate here as as well as on the flatter upper surfaces. So, 
provoked the uh, more stable, uh, you know, conducive environment for longer term growth. Okay. Go by. I just want to turn to starboard a little bit. Maybe line up kind of with my heading almost. We can kind of make a move 260 or something. My nav wants me to eventually end up at 280. But. See a Chrysler Gorgia in the bottom there. It's a possible Geodia sponge, the Explore. kind of round grapefruit sponge there. Okay. And yeah. We'll uh, go 260. Copy. Bridge kind of living now. on this uh, cliff face here at this edge. Hi, Bridge. I'd like to request a ship move, please. Ooh, fish. Range one five meters. <laughs> bearing two six zero degrees. Yeah, kind of partial. Speed yeah. zero decimal two knots. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very slow moving fish. Well done. Good copy. Take your bridge. Excellent. I'm splash on that there. Well. Okay. Got it. Video. So this is a halosaur. Oh, you want to give me? Uh, Christopher no, take Kelly. More, you can take more zoom. I'd rather have more light. And it's different okay, from the other halosaurs that we've seen so far. The other halosaurs we've seen have been a very silvery, light we've color. This one is very a, dark. Uh, ground fault on Cirrus is late post before. Is that expected? Uh, no, not expected. Yes. <laughs> can see what bank it's coming from. And we're, uh, we might have sounded excited when we saw the fish. Video, uh, just a warning, I'm going it's something we haven't seen too much of during uh, any of our dives. Usually just a handful of, of individuals and, and then even fewer species. So we didn't see a fish at all yesterday on our deeper dive. Um, so uh, we're getting a little excited when we see a fish. And I've just been informed that we have actually seen this uh, this type of fish before. It just so happened to be when I was at lunch, of course. <laughs> you can see this fish is moving very, very slowly. Um, many of the fish that live in the deep ocean move slowly to conserve their energy. There's not a huge amount of food in the deep ocean, and so you don't want to expend your energy too much more than you have to. So this fish is moving nice and slowly. Just going with the flow. Seems to be on the mids. Okay. There he is, clear. Okay. It's almost like it has a little parasite on one fin there. Next, next video. Ships on the move, pilots. All right. Full wide. Ships on the move, so gonna stay ahead, stay safe here. Coming up, go pilot a little bit, go with me. Coming up. Don't see as much life in this area. Looks like another bathypathies there, just on this pavement. Seen a few of these so far on this dive. And these are actually black corals, and they're named black corals Correct. because of their skeleton. Because uh, obviously, as you can see, this one is orange. It's not black, but it's a right, skeleton of these okay. black corals. is uh, is a very dark, deep, uh, pearlescent black color. And so they're named for their skeletons and then overall morphology. I don't know if we've zoomed in on the black one yet. Take it. The zoom is not responding. Oh, and another crinoid on the rock there. Sorry. One of the taxonomic features of these 
black corals are these long, drippy tentacles. They have, each polyp has two very long tentacles on it, and you can kind of see them dripping down. Oh, this one has a potential worm in the center there. Maybe. Yeah, I, I think one of the cool things about this is um, they're in the hexacorallia, so each polyp actually has six tentacles. And what's cool when you look at this, you can see that the um, polyp is actually stretched out along a branch. So, as you say, it looks like there's two. Two of them in the center will have the mouth, and then there will be two other pairs flanking it on either side. So it's being stretched out. <laughs> and then you're seeing that scale worm right in the center, and this is a very commonly observed association. And I think it may be host-specific. That is, there are specific species of polychaete that associate with these uh, bathopathies. It looks like there are two of them, at least on there. Yeah, there's two. There's definitely two in there in the center there. Full screen. And the video is clear. Okay, thanks. Video, you wanna see, show me what's in the darkness? The fish at the bottom. Okay. Now, how about the big fish? Big Let's fish. go for big fish. Okay. Um, here we have another fish. Kind of swimming down this wall. And this one is really different. Looks uh, a little beaten up. And it has a... Looks like a isopod on its, uh, on its fin there. That's a great side view. Yeah, this one has definitely been in a few tussles. Looks a little older than the others. I don't know if you have any fish biologists uh, in our chat room here. He's going to be going. Get some turbid water over there. Nice prop wash earlier. So these isopods are often found on fish and they will uh, attach to the side of fish and they will either uh, eat other parasites that might be on the fish or sometimes they actually uh, suck the blood of the fish too. Okay, clear. Okay. Nice a great line. shot. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, one of our fish biologists will be able to identify that later on. Of course, all the video archives from this dive and all of the dives of the Okeanos Explorer are found uh, oh, no. uh, public access data, and so can be found um, uh, and used by any researchers around the around the world. I'm hearing That's from. A scientist on shore who's watching along, Amanda Demopoulos from USGS, who says it might be a thymosoid isopod. I probably just mangled that terribly, but... Um. <laughs> I think you did pretty well there. Okay. Another uh, anemone an there. Looks like just going to the bottom of the screen. Yeah, all closed up. Another one of these uh, sponges that we sampled a little earlier. This actually might be a great ledge to zoom in on, Pilot, just to Star. have a look and see if those are fossilized yeah, cup those. corals there. Yeah, video, it's an impartial. There's something kind of red on the lower. And here, it oh, definitely looks like we've got some sheet flow morphology. Okay. These, these kind of layered structure to the these to the rock. Just, it's, you know, not the not the yeah, pillow of assaults that we, we saw a little earlier and, and that are appearing above here, but a, a more sheet-like flow type. See those red things on the tips? Mm. Go up. 
coming up. Yeah, more of these tentacles from these benthic tenophores. Absolutely covered in them, this particular sponge. So they're um, kind of a slightly different white with this red center there. These are the benthic tenophores. And they have these long tentacles, which uh, help For them sure. to catch food particles. Okay. Yeah. You got the, more yeah, of these yeah, crinoids. Vertical. Beautiful. This is obviously a good place to uh, put in a fishing line. It definitely, a definitely. Of, a lot of them are fishing. You can zoom out a little bit. I'm going to have to maneuver a little bit, Roland. Yeah. We can call it clear. Okay. Try a bit of marine snow here. Yeah, and a little bit over to the right hand side there, there was a, a, a uh, an enemy, if we're not too far over it. Just have a quick zoom there. And this uh, ledge of potential fossil corals here. Okay. You guide me to the anemone. I, sorry. It's uh, it's actually all closed up. You can't see the tentacles. It looks almost like a, a sponge. It's kind of a pink color. Okay, right there. Very large. Oh, huge. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I thought that was, <laughs> that was an anemone. That's like, okay. Because <laughs> like, how do you not see that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, you can frame it up. <laughs> How did I even realize it? Hide in the plain sight? Yeah. Of course, now we'll find it's a sponge instead, which actually it might be. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's why it's good to zoom on these things. But, uh, yeah, I think that's actually a sponge. That's not an enemy. Okay. Just a very interesting yeah, color. Yeah, you know, yeah, usually right. sponges are whites, yellows, creams, but that yeah, one's kind of a go, really. pinky color. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pilot. Yeah. A prop wash. Hit it a little bit. Pretty light. It's called feeding mm -hmm. the locals. If we want, we could probably put another. Move in. Let me get above this real quick. And then we'll do Perfect. that. Perfect. Coming up onto the top of this platform here, I can see lots of pillows again, Kay. Jason. Yeah, we can do that. You want to do uh, uh, two eights here? This sounds great. Yeah, it seems like the, you know, these upper surfaces. Uh, have these pillows. Um, you know, these, these, like these uh, lava textures are really meters, somewhat diagnostic of, zero degrees, of the construction of, uh, of the seamount. You know, they don't all come out as, as a single eruptive event. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. Um, you know, they, it, it's built up over long periods of time. And, you know, during that process, uh, you know, the the way that the, the lava has come out and cool uh, can vary from, from you know, sheet flow textures, these more layered-like, to lobate-type sheet flexures, which uh, uh, have a, uh, you know, a more bulbous texture, and then to these pillows, which are uh, what happens when uh, lava comes out and, uh, you know, it, it's able to cool on the outside and forms a crust. Uh, the in inside remains molten and uh, is able to inflate um, and, and eventually will cool on the inside too. Cucumber here. And we're, snap it. we're left behind with uh, that. Take a break. Ah, uh, yeah. Look at that. Another sea cucumber. Uh, the sea cucumber. We've actually seen a few of these in our, our previous dives. There's actually a little xenophyophore in front of it. And um, in the bottom left hand corner, a little bit lower there, you can also see these are uh, fecal trails. So these are trails potentially left by this, uh, this sea cucumber. So these sea cucumbers ingest sediment. Um, so they have these uh, very specialized tentacles that help them bring sediment into their mouth. They have really long gut systems that are very simplistic and they okay, we'll um, the spend a lot of time in the gut with the, the sediment That's pulling out all the good nutrients and they um, poop them out in these poop trails at the end. And these trails can actually be lots of different forms depending on the species. Some of them do little spirals, some of them uh, do more straight lines. Um, you can tell a little bit about the sea cucumber by just looking at the at the fecal trail. And this was not a swimming sea cucumber, so we saw one that was a potential swimmer earlier, but this one is one that stays very much uh, benthic.
you can take a peek here. Getting back into a little bit more sediment before we you know, transition back into a seems like a, a bit of a steeper slope. Uh, folks are able to switch over to camera three, the live stream there. Um, you know, the, the sonar on D2 gives us a, a bit of a picture of what's up ahead. Um, we can see lots of returns coming back from these uh, exposed rock outcrops, um, showing that the you know the seafloor ahead is is uh, there's a big zoom on it if you switch over to camera three. I like to think of it as seeing into the future. Yeah, that very, it, uh, very much seeing into the future. We're, we're going to come up and see. Go ahead, Bridge. And I believe this Sorry, no, thank you, Bridge. this uh, this forward-looking sonar is new for this year. <laughs> yes, I believe so too. This is a new a new kind of sonar that they're just started using on the previous cruise or cruises. Yeah, the multi view. As uh, the the blue view. Yep. Yep. And it gives so much more detail. It's incredibly detailed. It's uh, really great watching that from back here and seeing what's going to come. This one. It's another little purple sea cucumber on the on the rocks there. We tend to see sea cucumbers in areas that uh, have a bit more of sediment cover because it's really the sediment that they uh, that they eat. It would be better if you got real close to the coral, to the small polyps. Okay. Oh, and our first metallogorgia as well in the background there. Our first metallogorgia. I know, uh, Are these the ones with the kind of lifelong um, associate? With a brittle star, yep, in the center. Yep, yeah. they grow up on this long stick. I know Scott's ears will have pricked up as soon as I mentioned the word metallogorgia. Get it to the camera. Okay. Get you nice close to one. They most absolutely did. And <laughs> yeah, this one, Scott might look. It uh, looks a little like it might be uh, one of the juveniles with more of the branches going down the stalks. Uh, just need the, the close-up to confirm that. Okay, you can come in and roll. Yeah. Um, if it is, um, it's certainly getting on towards its late teen years. Um, <laughs> and I would say, you know, the things we're seeing a little bit more characteristic of what we know Marshall. from the New England okay. Seamounts to the West. Center. Um, yeah, Rian, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, so typically, what we would refer to as the full adult stage of just a terminology of this metallogorgia would have only branches up at the top where you see the highly coiled arms of that brittle star, and no branches. They shed the branches going all the way down the stem. And this still has those uh, side branches, so I agree with you. This is uh, somewhere in its developmental cycle. And one of the things that's interesting, when they're even younger, they don't have the clump of branches on the top. Instead, they'd look like this little antenna with very small side branches coming off. Yeah, and I believe in, even when they're juveniles, they have a juvenile yeah, brittle star nice in the middle. Is that the correct? Left. Is that still your understanding of this, this species? That is absolutely correct. And before we talk about that, just notice this is also in the family Chrysogorgiidae, and I had said earlier that there's at least one that didn't have a gold skeleton. It was more dark, and here you can see through the That's tissue true. that dark skeleton. Also, a couple of uh, possum shrimp there, mice, you can see their gold red eyes. Really nice. So, yes, um, Jason alluded to this as we were it's zooming in. Man. We always see this one brittle star. Uh, okay. that's associated with this metallogorgia colony through all growth stages. So from the very smallest metallogorgia, the coral that we've seen, it will have a small brittle star in its branches. And the presumption is, based on all the evidence that we've collected, it remains on the colony throughout life. And to some extent, the hypothesis so is that it's, kind it's of waving around, so kind of getting rid of other things that settle on the it. The dance here.
pan down the stock. So you can see quite nicely this uh, brittle star has its arms out uh, into the current. So these brittle stars like to be up uh, up into the water current to be able to get food, good food resources. The further up off of the bottom you get just a little bit and into some faster current. Okay. Keep going. Thank you, pilots. Yeah. It's probably complete. Yeah. Right, looks like here, this rock here, it looks like a whole bunch of the crust is at that point. Sweet. Broken off and then uh, falling down slope. So, bridge, are we um, now? Now some of these areas on this is, is Hi, bridge. entirely Plus stable. Yep, there place. we are. Has a sponge hanging out on it. You can kind of see that crust uh, with the jagged edge. Uh, at some point, it uh, it broke off. But then okay. uh, the has started to reform again on, on that exposed surface. Okay. Go I go up to those. Looks almost like we're coming up a ridge feature with it dropping off to the right hand side here. Yeah, I can explore that. It's interesting. Yeah, we should see this Maybe a little bit some steeper, corals up ahead just as well. a little to your starboard side. Okay, as you come come forward a little bit. Just gonna saddle over so I can see that. I think we can see some more of these stalked crinoids. There's certainly been a lot of these crinoids uh, and l several different species as well on this dive so far. ship is underway, but I don't have a lot of tether left at the moment, so I'm going to stop here. And Another Iridogorgia as well, up these. on the top, top of this rock. I can frame these two up rolling while we wait for some more tether. One of these crinoids looks much healthier than the other, <laughs> the one on the left. Uh, definitely seems to be nice and full and feathery, like it's named the Feather Star, and the one on the right looks a little bit more ragged, like it's been through uh, been through well, something. That spider, I can, but, uh, I can Does that up. mean it's more tasty? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe something's come and taken a poke at it. I'd be interested what those uh, little branches are at the base of the left-hand stalk. Is that a little coral? Potentially a, yeah, that's a little, little, little bamboo coral of some kind. Very fine and very small. Just at the base of this crinoid. We have some interest in looking at the, uh, the crinoid that doesn't look so well. Uh, pilots, if that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's missing missing several arms. Broken away, lots of uh, pinules broken away. From Charles Bessing, both appear to be hyocrinids. I don't know if this is a, a predation event, something has come along and tried to eat this sea star, or whether something has just bumped into it and broken. Some of these arms can be really fragile on these on these crinoids. It's really curious seeing they're both so close together and yet looking so dramatically different. Thanks, video. We keep moving. I have a little more tether now.
Copy that. Thank you, Bridge. All right, ships all stop boats. Great. Copy that. can see that these uh, filter feeding and suspensions feeding organisms really like these edges. These edges where that flow is dropping off um, can funnel water and make it go a little bit faster, which brings more food and nutrients in a little quicker. And so that's often the place where you find these, uh, these uh, filter feeders. Two more of these bathypathies, or potential bathypathies, black corals here. Sponge and a crinoid. From Charles Messing, he says he has never seen quite so much damage to one of these before, but one of the arms uh, on that damaged crinoid back there uh, showed a bit of regeneration, so perhaps there's hope. Ooh, a little jellyfish. No snapper rolling? Is it too late to get just a quick zoom on the crinoid we're passing over? I see a number of uh, white balls on it. I'm wondering if they're little predatory snails. Yeah, we're just looking at a, a jelly. You'll catch up with the video here in just a second. But I, I don't think we've moved too far away to have a quick zoom on, the, we'll get the crinoid. on the crinoid there. This one? Yep. Okay. Oh, there's another uh, potential black coral in front of it as well. This is a different, uh, a different kind. Yeah, the black coral is, uh, I believe it's Parantopathes larix. Um, Tina Molitsova may have more to say. But that's the first time we've seen it. And again, we're starting to see lots of things that are characteristic of the New England which is really interesting. Yeah, very much. This, this is may also be a factor of our depth, right? We are a little bit shallower than we've been. Uh, I guess we go for That's correct. We're at 2,230 meters uh, currently. So just taking a closer look at this crinoid to see if we can figure out what these little yellow uh, dots are, kind of at the base of the pinules there. They actually look to be produced yeah. by that's the crinoid the itself. They're egg masses? Yep. Interesting. Yeah, that's where they produce the uh, gametes at the, the base of the pinules there. Nice. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go for the... Uh, Very nice. Thank, other, thank you, pilot. That's beautiful. Yeah. Go for the uh, other coral, maybe. Roll. Your volume is getting too low. Oh, my volume? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm just talking pretty quietly. I can uh, increase my volume. Rolling. Come back in if you wanted to get this coral. As Scott was saying, this is a parent and parent antipathies. Parent pathies. Oh, and this one potentially has uh, some eggs in it as well. Take more zoom if you, you got see some it. small uh, Those polyps are so closer. extremely okay. small. They are, and some of them are very swollen in the center there. Well, actually, did you need a closer look at this? I can resituate and get closer, but right now we're at max zoom. Uh, if we can, that would be great. Just okay. have a little, little closer look. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to let Bob take the tight zoom. Okay. Switching out video. Just going to get you nice and close. Go with the black background. Video, you can come in. We're going for this coral here. Try to get really tight on it. Want to see the detail? Consider you up here. Hold on. This particular species of black coral is really fine, really small polyps. Yeah, look at that. Beautiful.
If you have more zoom, you can take it. I'll try to keep you centered. Yeah, beautiful. Sorry, it's a little bit of an awkward position for me. So I'm moving a little bit. Yeah. I'll try to hold that. That might be my best shot. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, pilot. Yeah, good video. You come out. Keep going. Slippery rocks here. <laughs> Splash lasers by the base, just so we have it. Have a size, thank yeah. you. So, so these lasers are 10 centimeters apart. They help us to scale things on the seafloor because it can be very hard to realize how big or how small some of these features and organisms are. And so this is uh, the best way for us to be able to get sizes of, of things on the seafloor. So uh, Liz Watling, one of our biology experts on shore, has, has noted that uh, we're definitely starting to see all the common species uh, identified on other seamounts in the area, uh, both uh, previous dives on the corner rise and the New England seamounts. Um, you know, uh, and, and I think Scott mentioned it a little earlier that, you know, we're, we're at a, a slightly uh, shallower depth than we've been on on some of the other dives that were, were higher up on the seamounts. So, um, you know, the, the salinity of the water and, and the temperature conditions, obviously the food availability and and, and uh, appropriate Coming substrate here, for attaching to um, all seem to be here to, you know, to continue to add observations uh, to what have, have been done before. Hold that. A little guy. See the lasers there. That's great, pilot. Thank you. Hey, hey come on. We'll keep going. Do we want to put another uh, ship move in? It's definitely been That's an abundance of crinoids uh, during this dive, which has been great to see. Two eight zero is still good. Copy. Bridge over now. Hey, Bridge, we'd like to cross another ship move, please. Range one, five meters, bearing two, eight, zero like degrees. It's crinoids. Speed zero decimal two knots. Trail of crinoids. It is like a little trail of crinoids yeah. going uh, going through. Wonderful. It is. They're following you know, what might be a, like a, a, a lava flow that we've seen from the these bridge. elongated pillows and, and other things that kind of point down slope have, have uh Given the appearance that we're we're climbing up a, a lava flow, when the crinoids are, are taking advantage of, of of this slightly elevated ridge here, getting up high in the water column and and grabbing the food. We uh, should see this steepen up a little bit as we. There was definitely a something on that crinoid we just passed on lower right. Just do a little exploratory. I think there was a little fish that swam by there. And he's gone. And then I'm going to look to my starboard. Yep. There it goes. ROV safety here. Check out my blue view. I don't know if uh, anyone was able to capture what that one might have been. It was moving pretty quickly. Ridge. Here's a really good view of, of uh, you know, kind of the, the wider environment that we go up. Um, sometimes hard to capture that full uh, landscape view of, of what we're seeing, you know, when we're, we're focused on, on the camera one, uh, main five camera. Um, but uh, you, you can definitely switch over to stream two, which is the Sirius view, which is a little camera platform. Sitting above D2 gives you a, a wider view of the area. 
um, and and kind of the the the, the, the different uh, seafloor. Uh, right now, it, it seems we are kind of moving up a a more intact lava flow ridge. It's this bulbous nature of these pillows and other surface textures um, created by the a lava cooling and uh, continuing to flow underneath the crust. That's another one of these spiral corals off to the left. I'm going to use all the technical terms of spiral coral and crinoid. I certainly like spiral coral, but if you would like to know it, it is uh, Iridogorgia magnispiralis. We can just go with Iridogorgia among friends. Yeah, it might be easier for me. I get a little tongue twisted on, on some of these names. Sure, yeah, you know, most of them are Latin of some kind. Magna spiralis it just means large spiral. Which uh, yeah. we can see why you got that name. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Looks like a firework, actually, from this, I'm this angle. To say that. Yeah, good observation. I probably can't rename it Firework Coral, but, uh... Well, I don't think Copy anybody that, suggested a common name for it yet, so well start pilots. put that out there. Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm starting to feel that ship move. There. That's a great view. Right partial, down the spiral. Take partial zoom. Snap it real quick and then we'll keep going. Yeah, that's good. Hold that, hold that. Okay, we'll keep going, video. Thanks. I don't know if anyone can speak to it. May it was discussed before. What is there a reason why it spirals uh, like that? Does it, uh, you know, often we don't see that kind of morphology in, in the corals. Yeah, it's a good question, Jason. I mean, there's some conjectures we can make. So the architecture of the that? overall I'm colony is that bit. you see there are branches that are always coming off of one face. And all of the polyps, at least on this one, I believe, are just on those side branches. Uh, there are some other species where they may be on the main axis but as well. Forward here. But I think in uh, growing like that and spiraling like that, it's one way to spread out the... Um, the polyps yeah, from thanks, one another yeah. while maintaining in an appropriate current flow. Um, sure and maybe that's a strategy business. for when you don't um, secondarily and tertiarily thanks. branch branches. Go that is, with, yeah. all those side branches don't branch again. It's interesting that just to the right, I think going out of the frame with a look like a, a whip or a single uh, single branched. Uh, maybe a bamboo. Yeah, I think probably a bamboo first coral. Uh, that would be the first, I think, the first uh, frame uh, up bamboo this coral whip. whip of the day. I think this is what they're talking about. Amazing how the morphologies are, are, are so different, so close to each other. Well, yeah, so you know, you you've actually look at said something really interesting, and that is, you know, trying to come up with explanations for why, you know, this coral has this morphology and that one has that morphology. If they're living in the same place right next to each other, it's a little bit hard yes. to okay. point to some, you know, response to the physical okay. environment. Okay. Um, surely it was that way when they evolved however many millions of years ago, um, but it's kind of hard to um, say exactly what is the reason without doing a whole variety of experiments, and as you can imagine, okay, come in it's very hard there. to do experiments down here. Good idea on this one. Yeah, we, we've we mentioned many times we need uh, really long-term camera deployments, just staring at individual uh, colonies to, to to really see how they they, they shape and, and grow over time. Sorry. Yeah, there's a lot we could learn. Okay, you take one of those. You, you know, I think there are temporary associates as well. The various organisms will come in and uh, lay their eggs, or you know, we saw the shrimp before that hangs out while it's uh, spot, yeah. developing its own eggs. So we're getting a zoom, nice zoom on this bamboo coral. The tissue is actually much clearer, much more transparent than the bamboo coral that we saw earlier today. That one was branching, it wasn't a whip.
think I've stopped moving. Seems like a really high density of, of, of polyps there. I don't know if that says something about food availability or. Yeah, I think we do know that. Uh, that is also related to some species. So yeah. in the some taxa, you find Copy. Um, very yeah. dense polyps. Oh, like a little snail, yeah. I think. It's like my prop wash cut up to it. A little snail on that bamboo coral. Mm -hmm. close up. Pretty <laughs> pretty already now. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The base of the 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 move, Thanks for that question. One five meters, bearing two eight zero degrees, speed zero decibel two knots. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. So we're continuing up the slope of uh, uh, Castle Rock Sea Mount. If you're just joining us, uh, we're diving with the D two ROV uh, off the Noah Ship Okeanos Explorer. Um, we started our dive today around 2,330 meters. We're at about 2,218 uh, meters, moving up the the uh, eastern slope of, of Castle Rock, uh, an unexplored seamount here in the Corner Ice Seamount chain. It's the sixth dive of the uh, North, uh, North Atlantic Stepping Stones Expedition. Uh, and our third dive now um, in the corner ice seamounts. Uh, we had to change our plans uh, at the beginning of the expedition uh, due to some weather over both the New England and corner ice seamounts. And, and we took a little swing to the south, but uh, we were able to come back and 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 get to. Uh, uh, you know, visit the, the corner ice seamounts, which are, are really quite uh, limited in terms of uh, exploration, both you know, both uh, mapping and and visual observations of, of these environments. So, everything you're seeing now, along with us, is is uh, the first time it's it's been seen. Um, so, a lot of uh, scientists on shore uh, making observations of, of what we're seeing here. While we wait for some time. Um, and, and quite an interesting variety of sponges here. I don't know if any of your sponge All experts there. I hear, but it certainly looks like a number of different species. Okay, you can take more zoom, try to get the shape of this one. The some squat lobsters. Some associates. Jason, do you know if that's the same sponge that we had just previously collected? Does it look the same? Um, I'm not sure. It's a little... You know, uh, as a geologist, uh, all sponges look the same to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't look like, uh, it, it like it a nice isopod on there, which oh, looks like it's in there. the same group. Uh, maybe the cymatoids or the flabroliferans, where we saw one earlier on the side of a fish. Squat lobster. Oh, Okay. Pilot, can we cascade down? There was a coral that was requested to have a zoom at the base of the sponge. Sure. Zoom out a little bit, video. Let's try to find it. Also, a bunch more of the uh, platinum oh, headed benthic oh, no, pinophores on this sponge. Just oh, like the little baby one. We saw on one of the last times we zoomed on this sponge. Seems like a really large hold fast at the base there. Yep. Come in on this coral when you're ready. And it actually it kind of has the. the, the Shape we're seeing earlier on the rocks, these kind of rust colored patches. Is this the um, coral? So I wonder yes, if I those were so. okay. somehow we'll related this. to these type of hold fast that Next uh, copy. disappeared at some point. Copy that. Thank you, Bridge. This looks to me like I'll another uh, black coral in the genus coral? Parantipathies. We have Tina Bolitsova, who's an expert in that group, um, in the chat room. Okay, we're moving towards me. Shortly. We did see a taller version. Okay, video you can pull live Earlier, when you're ready. Just it was a species here on Dell. Get to you that one. Got some more tether, so I can keep going. Follow up this ridge. Thanks, God. Ooh, that carnoid looked like it had a bad day. Yeah, it's definitely missing quite a few. A few components. So our, our trail of uh, crow noise continues um, after we got past that vertical section and have been climbing up this, looks like a uh, 
a ridge formed by a, an eruptive flow, whether it was one or, or many. Um, we've been seeing these, these crinoids, some looking healthier uh, than others, um, but uh, quite abundant as, as we've been going up. And I think, uh, certainly a density of them we haven't seen so far in any of the dives. Wow! Look I can say that about every uh, all the the cephal biology we're we're seeing is uh, we're, we're slightly shallower That's cool. uh, than we've That's we've been so far in the dives. So we're seeing a, a different abundance and, and really in distribution. And, turn over here, just off to the uh, port side. Of we've seen before. Amazing how much a uh, hundred right. meters or two hundred meters of, yeah. of yep. water depth. Um, all right. The Let's changes back. can get into different water masses. Uh, two four zero, uh, two three zero. Different food availability. Keep going forward and up then. Can I see out into the darkness video? What do you got back there? Is that it? Okay. Yeah, a lot of these yellow crinoids seem Next to video. have the same amount the of arms. So I'm only seeing five on each of these stocked yellow crinoids, whereas some of the other ones that we saw earlier on the dive and in previous dives, they had um, definitely more than five. I can't recall the exact number, but these are very much, they look like lilies almost. And there was a question about um, what potentially could cause such damage to some of these uh, crinoids and I guess we still don't know. Charles uh, Chuck Messing said that he has seen some gastropods stocked on these crinoids but he hasn't seen them associated with such the damage that we've seen. Nav, when did that uh, ship move end? Three minutes ago. All right. Just gonna saddle over, check the sponge out. And Chuck also just mentioned that all members of the Hyocrinidae have, unbran have five unbranched arms, except for one species that's known from the East Pacific. Can we get a zoom in on that coral, please? Sure, absolutely. The Thanks. one in the center, right by the lasers. Absolutely, yep. Okay, good. And then after that, maybe on the on the uh, more vertical wall with those, where maybe have uh, desmophyllum hanging on it. So uh, zoom in. And over here, yeah, looks like the those. Good eye, Jason. You could hold that for a second. Slowly bring you to center. So this is a Chrysogorgia, and uh, like the one that we looked at earlier today, it also has a shrimp living in its branches. I don't see that that shrimp is uh, carrying eggs, at least not yet. This, uh, this colony's also dropped a lot of branches lower on the, uh, on the stock. Kind of interesting. Watch, did you need a closer look or was that a sufficient uh, view here? That's good, thank okay. you. Did you hear the request about the small cup coral right adjacent to it on the uh, rock wall? Uh, video zoom out, uh, help me find it. To the right or to starboard? Or? Uh, to the port side, right that white dot there. Oh, Jason, it. is that what you were referring to? Yeah, I couldn't see too much from a distance, but you that's snap the one. It, and then I can get closer if that's what they think it is. It's pretty bright, pretty reflective, huh? It's unclear. It might be a base broken off. Oh. I think you're right, Pilot. That nope. it looks like a coral base or a sponge base of something that was broken off at then at some point. Yeah, we'll let it go, video. Thanks, Pilot. Yeah. Thank you. Almost. We'll keep looking. <laughs> I'm 
just going to explore to our port, take a look at my sonar. Sirius is pretty hard to return over here, so... Just going to check it out. I think it's actually what you're centered up yeah, on there. The, the texture of the, 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 the lava yeah. flows here. Okay. Very bulbous. Because when you come back around to suggesting to six, eruption down the slope. It's pretty in line with what Cirrus um, is seeing over there. On this turn. Okay. Slightly elevated ridge going up. Um, you come up with certainly uh, crinoids have, uh, okay. have taken advantage of its position slightly elevated. I get that move in. Copy that. Perhaps flattening out a little Pretty bit. Driving a, a bit more sediment cover. It's amazing how much uh, the a very small move, please. Range one change in the gradient of the slope to uh, zero degrees. Speed allow these zero sediments to start accumulating. Good copy. Thank you, Bridge. Wow. These are quite the ridiculous colonies on this dive. Or the newly common named firework coral. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to explore to the starboard here. Get a feel for how steep it is here. Wow. <laughs> That is pretty steep. So we have estimated here, based off our bathymetry, the potential highest slope is about 45 degrees. Would you agree with that, pilot? Yeah, that looks like 45 to me. Pretty, pretty good estimate. Be a good hike. <laughs> And Jason, it looks like some of the morphology starting to change from more of that pillow lava feature where it looks, I mean, dead ahead right now, slightly more sheeted. Yeah, so it, it probably uh, suggesting something about, uh, you know, the lava flow, uh, you know, how it how it evolves over time. Um, certainly uh, in places it can be used to identify um, you know where the where the eruptive event was. Maybe we're, we're closing on that. Um, you know, we 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 probably won't see that kind of feature. Um, they tend to erase themselves over time as uh, they erupt more material. Um, but it does it does seem we're seeing less of these pillows and and more of the the sheety layered uh, sort of morphology. We continue to see quite thick uh, ferromanganese crusts um, with this petroidal texture. Uh, it's going to be the favorite word of, of the expedition, is petroidal, which is this, this uh, go for floating, bumpy, great, floating subject. you know, uh, yeah, like texture that, that, that? that forms on the top of the rocks, um, which is uh, somewhat diagnostic of, of the, uh, the ferromanganese crusts. We'll let it go. I don't, think it's I don't mean to interrupt Floater. you, but this what? What could that be? Small white ball with gelatinous <laughs> structure. I like over there. Pom pom. Pom pom. Uh, that's as good as a description pilot as <laughs> I've heard. So. I don't know. I just caught my eyes floating by. Looks like a galaxy. Its own little world at the bottom of the. Ocean. Copy that. Copy that. Thank you, Bridge. Got a little bit more tether now. I can kind of go up the hill. Got a pilot change coming up. I think we're going to do a pilot change up here. Watch the lead. We'll be back with you. No problem. Thank you. We can see a few more of those yellow stocked crinoids around. There's a small sponge at the base of the 
right hand quadrant there also. It's really interesting. I don't know, would you call it a high diversity of sponges that we've seen here? I've seen some sclero sponges and some varying different um, types here, but I can't say for sure if we'd call this a high diversity. I'm not sure either, Kim. You know, it's uh, that's a it's almost subjective, and it's a hard number, or it's hard to put a number to. You know, what is high diverse and low diverse? Um, certainly, we're seeing um, lots of different kinds of sponges today, uh, but I don't know. Um, I don't have data myself on what would be considered a high diverse area. What is the highest diversity that anybody's seen? for example, um, to be able to put that on a scale. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I mean, it is subjective to a point, um, but based off on the previous dives, if we're going off those as our marks, I don't know if I would call this as diverse, but definitely um, we are seeing quite a few and then we have a few corals that we've come across, so the Chrysogorgid, the um, Firework Coral, which now I can't seem to get out of my head <laughs> as the name. <laughs> hey, pilot. Hey, co-pilot. You're nice. welcome. <laughs> Greetings. Iridogorgia. Iridogorgia, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've seen at least, meters. I think, Copy what, that. three in that family, the Iridogorgia Viralis. We've seen a Chrysogorgia. Um, I'd just like to confirm like that the ship is stopped. And we've seen the Metallogorgia. Thank you. Um, so all three of those are uh, different genera. Nav, can you relay what the uh, bearing of the last few moves has been? The last, the last few moves have been at 280 degrees, 280. Copy, 280, thanks. Sounds good. Just going to get a little lay of the land here. Sounds like they've been steadily working their way up the space here. Encounters the occasional steep edge. You definitely here see the, 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 the different kind of morphologies from panning from these more uh, sheet type flows, the lower relief, to uh, more now, bulbous the, textures, uh, status of the ship? you know, perhaps indicating the, the ship is those, those pillow lavas that we've when been talking about. Um, oh. when did it stop? You know, these seamounts are made uh, up of, of uh, countless numbers of uh, eruptive periods, so uh, uh, lots of overlapping. I thought, so my camera's uh, at about 45. You know, uh, uh, that. volcanic Your flows reference. that, uh, you know, unfortunately the 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 abundant so uh, permanganate crust uh, kind of can hide the, uh, the differentiation between the two, yeah, so we still look for are not hard changes fast. in morphology Copy to that. tell we us something about uh, interesting how these rocks were emplaced. Uh, um, but those permanganate crusts also tell us a lot about so uh, like the, uh, the long-term environmental okay. conditions of, of the ocean, and when and I say long-term, the uh, these the crusts, uh, is that a, a desmofilm at the base of that crinoid? Yeah, we could uh, probably... Or another one of those hold fasts that, that we, heading on Sirius. we saw earlier. Work our way up this feature here. I got my eyes open for, for Rian. Uh, video, did you just zoom in? Thanks. Lots of interesting geology here. These fair manganese crusts sort of accumulate that 
at pretty slow rates, uh, on the order of one millimeter per million years. So, um, you know, where we see them being uh, thicknesses of, of centimeters or more, uh, you know, we start to, to really uh, go back quite a, a long way in time. You know, uh, every centimeter is, is 10 million years. So, um, you know, if we have five centimeters of, of, of crust, it could be as much as uh, 50 million years of, of precipitation of, of those minerals out of the water column. Um, and as as those water masses change over over time, which they do, uh, perhaps many times during that that long time God, period, um, these crusts record a, a history of Jason of those changes. Sorry, yep. sorry to interrupt. There was just Bottom a request right to corner, look copy. at the edge of the crust where it looks broken off there. So before we left, I wanted to make oh, okay. sure you that. All right, just so I think that's down to the right. I think we're going to go for a zoom on this uh, broken crust down here. We just we passed over. We can zoom now, come in. Yep, right, right in front of us there. Thank you. So we have scientists on shore who are, who are very interested in these crusts for, for multiple reasons. Um, and we have, we've been sampling a few as, as we've gone along. It's like quite a thick coating of that, uh, that uh, iron manganese, uh, manganese oxide coating. Thank you, pilot. Good copy. Oh, can we have some lasers in there? Just as uh, we, there we are. There they are. They're yeah. coming in. Yep. Good copy. Perfect. Just for a little reference there. That's it. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. You can come on that video. Thank you. Nicely done. How do we feel about a ship move, front row? <laughs> Are you, uh, uh, I can't, uh, sorry, I was muted. Is that better? Better. You want to go 260, you said? field of good crinoids and sponges. Yep. Um, 15 meters. Yeah, what if previously? It'd be great to get a, a zoom on the yellow sponge. I don't believe that's one that we've seen uh, on this transect so far. Copy that, watch the one coming into center. Yes. Good copy. Yep. You go for partial here, video. Bridge ROV nav. Thank you. I'd like to request a move range one five meters bearing two six uh, zero path, path degrees black coral at speed base there. decimal two knots. It's funny, these little cracks in the rocks too. It looks like they're little uh, pieces of bamboo coral skeleton. Good copy, thank you. So this uh, yellow sponge is uh, not one that we've seen seen yet. Yeah, this yellow sponge, I have no idea what it is, but, uh, Rian, I think you'll recall that we saw numerous of these um, also on the New England Seamount. Yes, I believe so. so. Yep. Yeah, so another piece of evidence that the community that we're looking at shares uh, similarities with those western seamounts. Nice barnacles there. Do you the want to come well. in a little further, watch this? Um, there are actually, um, there's some nice uh, stalk barnacles over to the right, if you want to pan over a little bit. Copy that. This would be great to have a quick image also of. Also, more of those, the... Uh, those sheared hold class that we were seeing. Yes, yeah, and then down in the cracks below, there were pieces of what looked like bamboo coral. You know, very distinct small Coming pieces. More video. These stalked bar barnacles. Beautiful. Yeah, so barnacles are actually crustaceans, and the uh, the uh, kind of feather duster that you're seeing sticking out is actually their legs, so they're actually head down, so their legs stick out into the water column, and they grasp for food, picking food out of the water column. We very often get some really quite big species uh, of these stalk barnacles in the deep ocean. Beautiful. Thank you, pilot. You're welcome. Come on out. Here. Thank you. So we did another 15 at 260, correct, Nav? Correct. Good copy. 
We're about five meters into that. Copy, thank you. There's quite a bit of interesting biology on these rocks over here. It's really quite abundant. It's beautiful. It you know, beautiful. There's sponges and these beautiful yellow crinoids. These right uh, Iridogorgia spirals. I heard that maybe they had been uh, renamed fireworks while I was at lunch here. Is that true, Jason? Someone uh, on 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 the chat or, or on the conference line mentioned. I'm not sure who, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, sounded like Jason, a great idea. Yep. Jason, you need to take more credit for that. <laughs> very evocative of when you look at it from the spiral down. <laughs> yeah, very much. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll take all the credit for it. Uh, there's there's also a Chrysogorgia uh, that was next to the um, Iridogorgia. Kind of sitting in between the two Iridogorgia there. I think I saw it as we, as we went by, as we pan over to the left here a little bit, it might pop into view. Yep, there it is. Were you wanting to zoom on anything, watch later? Uh, we can zoom in on the little Chrysogorgia. It's the little one, kind of dead center, or bright orange. Copy that. We'll go for a zoom here video. Oh. So the last two of these that we've seen Copy that. have had Thank a shrimp you. in there, so we can look to see if there's a shrimp if you're going to do the zoom. Thank you. Can you go a little more. Is the shrimp on the on the ground there? Uh, oh, right there. Yeah, I see it. Copy that. But I think what Scott was talking about is there might actually be a shrimp in the coral to the left. Oh, there's a little tiny baby crinoid. Look at that. Hanging out at the bottom of the sponge. This uh, sponge looks quite similar to the one that we collected yesterday. It was an unknown species. Yep, and there's a, a shrimp in the middle there. And this uh, Chrysogorgia coral, and as Scott was saying earlier, these uh, shrimp are often females and loaded with eggs, and so they're probably protecting themselves and their young uh, inside the middle of these uh, these corals. Beautiful. And I think I could see in there um, that purple color, and those may be the eggs being held by the uh, swimmerettes, which are those swimming legs under the abdomen. It's very hard to tell them inside there. You know, they, they really embed themselves in the middle of these corals to protect themselves. Yeah. Beautiful. Good place to be. Apparently, it's a good place to be. Yeah. Thank you, Pilot. You're welcome. Come on in. I'll note also that uh, a Just lot of those polyps here. on that Chrysogorgia colony look swollen at yeah, the base so and kind of whitish. So I think uh, yeah. lots of reproductive material right in there, yeah, preparing yeah, gametes, yeah, you know, sperm and egg. And so. Um, Oh, there's also a sea cucumber at this bottom. Yeah, come out full wide, did you? Okay. Little um, look in between the skin. There's some right question now. about whether there's any seasonality. I think, Rian, you know plenty about this and whether the reproductive cycle in the deep sea here is timed at all to the input of food that's come to the bottom. And so I'll leave that as a lead-in for you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Yeah, so... Um, you know, when uh, we first started thinking about the deep ocean back in the 1800s, it was assumed that the environment in the deep sea was, it was all steady. It was all going to be cold and dark uh, all year round. And what we now know is we actually do see some seasonality in the deep ocean. Uh, one of the, the ways that this can be driven is by phytoplankton blooms. So we get blooms up in the upper ocean, often in the spring or in the late fall. And as these blooms die, they're actually transported down to the deep ocean. Um, it can take about uh, a month for plankton material up in the upper ocean to reach down to about 1,000 meters or so in some areas of the world. And that uh, large bloom actually uh, is this large source of food for animals on the, on the deep sea. And so that can cause things like the animals being able to reproduce uh, seasonally or um, being able to uh, uh, spread their young seasonally, spawn their young. Seen more sediment again. Um, Although no, well, it might be a slight change in the gradient here, but not too much. You see a lot of these still crinoids, so um, they're all uh, sitting on, on probably 
you know, substrate that's just uh, below the surface. Last so. move end. Ended it four minutes ago. Copy that. Pilot, do you want another 15 minutes? Do you want to go towards that large rock? Or wonder stay if we can try here for that so. crust. Um, years out. Yeah. We're able to sit down. still lines up pretty good. Yeah, we can do 260. I think we might be able to reach that with the tether still. Okay. Go ahead, watch lead. Sure. Do you see any in the field of view that you're... Uh, nav, hold off on that. Hold on. Yep. Thanks. Copy. Standing. Uh, let's see. So, or were you wanting to try to grab a piece of the crust you were saying, or? Okay. We can certainly try. I know we've had mixed results. Copy that. Yeah, stand by a nav. We'll try to grab some of this crust and then we'll think about a move. Copy. What do you think, Sean? Where's a good place to grip this crust from? Um, boy, I don't know. I just center it up. Yeah. And then just kind of tap it with the fingers and see if anything comes loose. Copy that. Yeah, I think that's the best you can do. Looks like we've got it almost between the skids here. Yeah, so the pilots are just looking here to see whether we can collect a, a sample of that ledge. Um, it's uh, mixed. Sometimes they come away pretty well. Sometimes uh, they are firmly attached to the substrate, uh, so they're, they're going to have a, a go here to collect. Up. Copy that, yeah. Think. Just trying to get an idea of current here, putting in joy lock. Relatively stable, but we're kind of bouncing a little bit. Wonder if it'd be better if I rotated my skid a little bit. Give me one second. stable there yeah that's good all right so the port side box is empty copy that so um i should probably do you, you want to poke it first and then we'll open the box if we think uh i would kind of poke the perimeter with the mm -hmm. fingers see if anything's loose okay and then if we if you find something loose then you could depending on the size you can go for the box open yeah. the lid or you can potentially use a suction sample if it's small enough. Too Copy small that. for the fingers. Um, Sounds good. And so our hydraulics look good? Hydraulics are up. I'm looking at the arm there. Copy, thank you. Getting in position. Maybe in the hydraulics. Arm is live. And indexing in. And I was kind of follow you center with the... Copy that. Yeah, that's exactly what I would do. Just kind of poke the perimeter here, see if anything is loose. Does not appear to be. Yeah. Seems pretty cemented. What about on the right hand side? Mm -hmm. Does any of that look a little softer? I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't look like that's going anywhere. Yeah, unfortunately. We'll try to give this right side a little lift and see. Mm 
<laughs> it doesn't look like it. <laughs> That's okay, pilot. We'll keep our eyes open for other potential areas we could collect that crust. Yeah, copy that. Thank you. Yep. All right, I'll follow you back. Copy. How's that look? A little rotate there. Yeah, maybe just a little inboard. Copy that. Hair and yeah, looks great. Copy that. The next thing up. All right, securing so hydraulics. Hydraulics off. I just saw again to ramp up, enable, and it drops it down to zero. Yeah, down to 400, right? Yeah. Yeah, I talked to Josh about that this morning. It sounds like that's kind of just the default config for it. Yeah. All right, I will put your mini juice back. Copy that. Yeah, if you see anything else that you'd like to try to poke watch, Lee, just let us know. That's great. Thank you so much. They're going to keep eyes open in the chat room for a suitable rock. Sounds great. I'll take my camera back. Thanks for the extra eyes. All right. I think we can probably get that ship moving now. Copy that. Thanks, Nav. Bridge ROV nav. It's like there's I'd some like sediment for you here, Jason. Range one five meters, bearing two six zero degrees. Speed yeah, decimal two. Yeah, ordered some over at, uh, at lunch. So <laughs> got some got some uh, weekly developed ripples there. So Good copy. Thank you. Get an idea of which way the current is flowing. Um, you know, and a lot of these sediment planes we've seen so far, we haven't seen too many ripples be developed, which suggests that there isn't much of a sustained, uh, you know, current flow. Uh, here it appears that um, at least weekly there's one developed be a large that is uh, okay. sort of wrapping around the seamount, yeah. and that's perhaps where the shallower depth than we've been on other dives, so um, closer towards the top of the seamount. Um, we may be seeing more more of this as pain current. I think there was a little fish right down at the base. I don't I think it's oh there it is. Swimming in front of us right now. <laughs> there he goes. It <laughs> might be a difficult one to catch. Yeah. <laughs> Seems that whenever Jason talks about sediment fish appear. <laughs> I think it's almost when I talk about anything, something else appears. So. Do we think that's the fish giving Jason a hint? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Jason, how is your fish ID? Uh, if if it is uh, a fish, I can get to the level of fish. Perfect. Um, that is it. It's a really good thing that we have some fantastic scientists on our chat room joining us who do specialize in fish. We have some sponges appearing at the top of our screen here. I'm going to rotate camera up a little bit. Probably. Geodia, it looks like, in the Copy center that. there. It's a uh, 3-0 right and, uh, there. Right thank you. I'm not quite sure what that one on the right is. It's got kind of two pinnacles staring at us. Would you like to zoom on it? Watch the... That would be great. Thank you, pilot. Copy that. All right, video, we can go for Maybe partial here. Maybe a little sponge, potentially. Looks like it has something growing out of the top of it. Is it a barnacle, maybe? Maybe. Very nice. Yeah. You know, sometimes we zoom in and we still can't figure out what it is. <laughs> I think it was potentially a coral stalk, and I wonder if those are little zoanthids or something on there. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, we can go for a little more. I'll adjust the camera. Nope. Oh. Just in the edge there, pilot, but I see Copy that. Here, yeah. yeah, little zoanthids. There we are. So it's uh, a frayed sponge wrapped around an old coral skeleton, and uh, with some of these zoanthids. Thank you, pilot. That's great. Yep, no problem. 
Alright. Whenever you're ready, video, we can ease out. You can come on out, video. Thank you. See a little uh, anemone tucked in behind the Geodia sponge there. Copy that. Thank you, Bridge. Beautiful. And some other sponges in the distance. This looks like a definitely kind of a pillow boulder field. These uh, little ponds of sediment in between. And each time we zoom in, we see lots of different organisms, lots of these crinoids. Some bamboo coral. You saw one of my favorite corals earlier today. Aritagorgia. Uh, yeah. I could have guessed Copy. that one. <laughs> oh. It is stunning. Yeah. Probably are. my favorite of all the corals. Yeah, sure. They're just so huge and enormous. Their presence uh, kind of overarches everything around it. Ah, oh, there we go. This fish. Do we want to go for a quick zoom on the fish? That would be great, pilot. Quick Thank zoom you. For this video. Come on in. I'm not a fish biologist, but I'll throw up potentially a little grenadier or something. See if I'm quickly corrected. Yep. No, I'm actually, there we go. Rat tail grenadier. Again, that slow sinusoidal swimming as we learned from Peter Oster. Moving slowly through the water column so as not to use up too much energy. Uh, Mike Vecchioni fast. suggests a round nose grenadier. Off he goes. Thank you so much, pilot. You're welcome. Oh, a sea cucumber there. Uh, <laughs> Wrapped around that sponge. The hair. <laughs> Actually, the vine looks pretty good. Copy that. Yeah, come on out, video. Thank you. Oh, and the bottom right hand corner. Go down again if you can. We might have another one of those swimming polychaetes. Where did it go? Uh, I think it, uh, uh, right oh, there. right, uh, yep, almost central. Yep. Quick zoom. Thank you. Oh, it's actually crawling, crawling along the, along the rocks there. Is that the same one we saw yesterday? I don't think so, no, it's parapodia, so the little projections on either side look very different. The ones yesterday had these almost big, almost like swim fins, <laughs> and you know, all these rows swimming along, whereas this one definitely has more walking type legs. And I think that this is a scale worm of some kind. Oh, you can just see a, a few of the little scales on its back end, though it looks like it's lost some in the middle, and they do lose these scales when they um, get into fights or predation events. But it seems the scales work. Yes, yes, they can release the scales. <laughs> or I should say, that maybe they don't release them themselves, but they can be taken away and, and regrow. Oh, there it goes. Oh. Beautiful. Yep. Back into this little <laughs> hole. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pilot. You're welcome. Come on out, video. I was sneakily also interested in this area because there are cup corals, fossilized cup corals growing on this, this ledge here as well, as we've seen throughout this dive in several areas. So we haven't seen any accumulations in the sediment, which we we're kind of hoping for to be able to get a collection. Uh, if we can uh, snap zoom on this left-hand rock face that's just coming into into view here. This guy Pilot. centered up right here? Right on the lasers. Yep, be perfect. That. Thank go for you. A zoom here video. I think these are these cup corals. Very old, you know, they're covered over this, with this manganese oxide, um, which grows about a millimeter per million years. Um, and these are fossilized corals, probably Desmophyllum dianthus, and maybe some other species that are in here as well. They have this very distinctive trumpet shape um, with the calyx that stretches over the sides, gives them kind of like a fan shape. See some little brittle stars and snails living amongst them. That's great. Thank you, uh, Pilot. Yeah, no problem. Come on out, video. What's always really cool is the closer you get in, the more small, tiny fauna you oh, see. Oh, yeah. You see those Thank little you. tiny sponges and little tiny hydroids. 
even a face that doesn't look like there's much there always has something on it. Definitely, you know, and often we focus we on kind of the, the larger We're all stuck organisms, here. the big yes. mega spiralis yeah. and, and these larger corals. But see. every time sure. we zoom in, we see some uh, some of these smaller organisms Same, that are also uh, making their home in this deep uh, sea environment. Yeah, so. I think we're going to just peek our head over this okay. little ridge ahead of us. And then One of the things the that we frequently get asked by people same, uh, is, like, what's down there? Return, and, you know, like, people think about the deep turn. sea being so far yeah. away, which it is, and so yeah. remote, which it is, and dark and cold, which it is, but it certainly is not barren, and it is not devoid of life. Definitely not, definitely not. And it's interesting to think, you know, about 150, 200 years ago, it was thought that it was devoid of life and nothing, nothing could possibly live there. It's much too, uh, much too deep, much too dark, much too uh, hard to, to, to make a living as an organism. And, and here we are today looking through a video camera, projecting this out to the yeah. world so that scientists and, and the public can watch this. And we can very yeah, clearly see the deep sea is yeah. anything but lifeless. Let's uh, stretch out to this face here before. I think one of my favorite things yeah, about yeah, ocean exploration is that every day um, we're seeing something yeah, new and you now. never really well, know exactly what you'll find, first. but it is Copy always that. interesting. Thanks. It Camera's definitely is, definitely is. Right and there. sometimes we see the same things, Copy but it's still degrees. interesting to see them in a new location. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Looks like this wall too is covered in those fossil corals. And on the top here, we have these crinoids and sponges. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, now it looks like it's starting to spread out more. Copy that. Pilots, if we could have a look at the very base of this cliff, that would be helpful if uh, we're not too far. Yeah, we're in a good position to do that. Thank you. Stand by. What we're looking out for is uh, basically some of these fossil corals that might have dropped off the wall and whether they form little patches to potentially do a locate, uh, collection. How's that watch lead? Would you like to descend and get a little closer to it or yeah if we could zoom in a little bit on the uh, kind of right hand quadrant you can see um not the rocks but kind of the more broken up material that might be some of these fossil corals copy that and there's interest in these fossil corals because they I can actually be in. dated so uh, we're able to use various uh, paleoclimate techniques to be able to to date some of these corals and find out when they were actually living here and when they were alive and they also hold records of what the water masses were like when they were living as well. So we can actually get records of what the, the ocean looked like uh, 10,000, 100,000 years ago. I think I see, if you go down into the sediment, pull out a little bit, mm -hmm. there's some of these corals down here. here. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Do you see um, what we're talking about, Pilot, yeah, here? Yeah, these guys right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a request for some of these uh, to collect Copy that. And I'm not sure whether the, using the uh, slurp hose as a scoop and scooping into a bio box or... Would they be okay to be slurped in total for They themselves? could, yes. Yeah, if they're loose enough and don't get clogged is the only yep. concern. Yeah, I that would, would work. Take the nozzle and just kind of... Do you think that's a possibility, Pilot? Yeah, I think we can, conferring with Copilot real quick. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. I think, yeah, I think that would work. Okay. There, you can kind of loosen them up a little bit if you need to. Yeah. Um, and if they're loose, yeah, I think they'll just. Yeah, copy that. Up. Do these uh, watch the? Do these particular ones we're looking at look good, or should we come wide and see if there's a, a more interesting looking one? These look really perfect. This okay. is the right uh, species. This is a Desmophyllum. Um, if that. it's not in the best place, we can certainly keep looking. Can we come on out, video? Let's yep. take a look and uh, we'll see. I think this might be accessible there. There's oh, there's a whole bunch of Oh, wow. If you go a little bit further down yeah. central, there's a huge pile of them. <laughs> that might be a pile, might be yeah. uh, A little yeah. further down, or what I'm pointing at straight ahead? Either one. Either one? Yeah, down there is a lot. Yeah, this looks like a pretty yeah. good stable position. Is uh, Sirius in a good state right now? Yeah, I'm all stopped. Copy that. Um, looking at you, 5-0. So it looks good. Copy that. Yeah, watch the. I think we're going to just come down to this pile here and see what we can do. That's perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. Hi, this is Watch 2. Go ahead, Watch 2. Hey, if you end up getting some um, sediment with it, we that would be great because that <laughs> will be helpful for our geology characterization as well. Copy that. We'll see what we can do. Thank you. Yep. So I will put you on. Or if you can only get sediment, that, that's okay as well. <laughs> two, two for one, Jason. Two for one. <laughs> 
Oh, oh so we can't have here. sediment without the, the car. Okay. Yeah, that looks like a good spot. The swing arms are clear. Looks Copy. good. Getting a little rotation. Let me lock in the joy locks here. Stand by. A little shifty. Forward. I think I'm bumping some of these rocks here. Stand by. That looks somewhat stable there. A little bit of movement. I'm going to come down just a meter or two. Copy that. Tether's nice and loose, but just in case. Pull out. Um, that looks good there. And just for awareness for our folks on shore, um, we are going to ca categorize this as a geological sample for the the sediment and the, the kind rubble of rotating here. rotating on these rocks Just here. for awareness. Do I just need to lock in a little bit of rotation, maybe? Uh, I don't think you can't lock in a rotation. Okay. Um, Let's Maybe. see. That looks pretty good, actually. Let's see. You put auto heading in. That'll help. Yeah, let's do that. That's pretty good there. Yeah. yeah. Feel good about that. Yeah. All right. I will get... This up. So... I think the drawer should extend no problem. Yep, it looks good. You can draw out and draw out enough. Go from there. Yeah. Do I draw out now? I think so. We're gonna try to poke it with the scoop rather than the claw first, is that right? Um I think that makes sense, yeah. Okay. I think it should. Looks loose. Alright, so let's see. Sample boxes. Valve packs on. All right, I'm extending the drawer slow. And I usually use like a grip force five. Okay. For the uh, suction sample. Stand by. Oh, you know what, Pot? It just just touched the uh, drawer. Uh. So I think you might have to rotate a hair. Like this, uh, so it's a little more flat. I okay. Think that toe is just touching. Rotate uh, starboard um, or port. Sorry, to port a little bit. Okay. Copy that. So just reposition like that, maybe. Pilot, this is Watch Lead. Go ahead, Watch Lead. I just have one quick question before yeah. you guys determine which chamber you're going to be putting the sample into. Uh huh. Um, do you know what mesh size you have on the suction sampler? We have. Three coarse, one no filter, and one fine. And I believe, what's the fine we have equipped, Sean? Is it a thousand? I believe so. It's a thousand, very, very, very fine. Yeah. Could we store this in the fine uh, chamber, please? We yeah. can certainly give that a shot. Thank you. No problem. That is. Gets five. Let me look at it. Yeah, so then I think if you just shift now lateral a little bit. To center that up, Copy lateral that. Um, starboard a hair. Copy that. Approach on these rocks here. And then rotate just a little more port. I think, yeah. Hopefully that gives us some more draw out. Copy that. See if we're stable here. I think we are. That looks pretty good. Well, still moving a little bit. You just put a little bit of Z bias down. Yeah. Nope. I'm bouncing off those rocks a little standby. Yeah, keep uh, coming up off the bottom. Just stand by. Trying to 
blocking the C bias, but it keeps moving. You might still be hitting the drawer if I park it here too. What do you think? I think, yeah, that might work. Okay. Go for drawer. Uh, drawer extending slow. We might still just move it a hair. Yeah, you're just slightly. Yeah, maybe just try backing up like a meter. Okay. Yeah. See if that gives you a more stable platform. Got 30 down. Yeah, it keeps wanting to push me left. I don't know if it's the current or... It can come down a little more. It could be current on the tether. Give you little tugs. We can down another meter or two. Back up and down. I'll put Sirius close. Ah, uh, gotcha. So if there's higher currents up where I am, it could pull the tether. Which just give you wobbles. Yeah, stand by. Watch lead side. We're trying to get a stable position here. No problem. Take your time. Every time I do that, stand by. Thirty down, a little forward. You can try giving it thirty five if you need it. Yeah. Just doesn't want to seem to stay. I'll try a little bit more downward. It's 
seems a little better. How's the drawer there? It's stable. Yeah, let me try extending it. Pushing a little bit, but not too bad. Yeah, I think it's just... It's still this toe that's hitting. Yeah. Do you want me to try to rotate the port a little bit? Again? Yeah, right there. Just pushed you. Yeah. Let me try a little rotation again. I think the problem was when I rotated this way last time, I felt more lateral. Yeah. More lateral push. But let's see if we can lock it in. Downward, forward. So that's about the same amount of lock. Let's see if it drifts. Yeah, it keeps rotating, see? But you might have enough room to get the drawer out there. Yeah, let me try. Let's try it. Still bumping a little bit, but try right. a little bit more. I think the joy lock, yeah, might be able to hold you. Yeah, I mean. That's enough if you're careful. As long as you don't get too close to the lens if you're up for it. Okay. Yeah, we'll give it a shot. All right, hydraulics are up. We're on canister five. The fine filter. Copy. I will center you up with the... Thank you. Mini sieves. Arm coming online. Are hydraulics enabled? Yes, my drugs are up. Okay. Yeah. Arm online. Copy. And I'll just kind of follow you to the center of the nozzle. Copy that. All right, I'll hold right there so you can just see the. Copy. Uh, and actually, do you want me to put your mains? See, do you want to bring one of your mains inboard and point it? Yeah, down? it'd be nice to have a little bit of light in there if you don't yeah, mind. It's pretty dark. Thank you. Stand by. And is there a desired grip force for grabbing the? Uh, I do like five or six. Five or six. Copy. Four is usually a little too light. Okay. Alright, that's inboard. That should give you a little better lighting there. Copy that. If you don't mind helping me line this up just a tad. Yeah. So the best thing you could do is like straighten your forearm out. Mm -hmm. So right now you're a little forward, so just back it the forearm down like that a hair. Copy that. Get it away a little bit. Yeah, and then easiest thing, straighten up like that and just kind of come down on it. Copy that. If your joint's nice and straight there. And do you do a little pre grip before you go in? Yeah, with the temp probe, um, squeeze a little bit, not all the way. Copy you just want to wrap the fingers around the. Uh, the black Dalrin part where it's ribbed. Copy that. That's the uh, 
And yet, a combination of these two work really well. Yeah. This for lining up and this for proximity. Good copy. Looks like that's pretty lined up. Yeah, so now just come a little closer. You're down far enough, just a little closer to you. Copy. And uh, that should be home once you're there. Yeah. Right. Lock that in. Locked in. All right. So now what you want to do is just pull it straight out without Copy. putting too much of a bend in and then I'll retract the drawer. Yeah, so just watch the, so your wrist is just a little bent. Copy that. Just makes it a little smoother pulling it out. Just come a little bit to uh, starboard there. Straighten it. Yeah, that's looking good. I'm going to track the drawer. All right. And then, so yeah, now I would just kind of, with the nozzle, you can kind of point it to your meniscus maybe a little bit. And then see if it's loose. Copy it. Gently kind of scrub the sediment with it. And then when you're ready, I will. Enable suction. And then do you want me to move the mini Zeus up to center you up? Think I'm at max wrist roll there. Can you rotate like this? Yeah. I can rotate that way. So I can do this here with the mini Zeus. Okay. And then if you just... So that's a good spot. And then just come down like that a little bit. Yes, yeah, so that's a nice view because you can see the tip with the both cameras like that. Mm -hmm. Is that looking good? Yeah, I think right right around lasers looks like a good spot. Copy that. We'll just give it a poke first. Yeah, and you can rotate your wrist like that. Actually, it looks great. I will enable suction. Copy that. I'll give it a little shake. Definitely getting some sediment there. Yeah. And there's a piece. All right. Yeah, you definitely have some of the bio box. So I will gnaw that. Copy that. That looks good. Got some sediment and other items in there. Looks good. So now it's just the reverse. You can uh, come up a little bit, get it level. Your nip cam's real good there. Copy that. And straighten it out a little bit with your wrist, go like this. I'm going to enable a little more suction just to get the remnants in. Copy that. That looks clear. Suction disabled. Alright, so now I will extend the drawer back to where it was. Extending drawer now. Good copy. Thank you for the suction. Stop there, and the, yeah, just reverse. Copy All you have that. to do is straighten your joints out, and then if you just shoulder inboard, get it close, then just slowly release, and you're, you're done. So pause right there. I think all, all you have to I do see. just come up and yeah, straighten your wrist. How's that looking? 
yeah, straighten your wrist a little more. Oh, it's looking great. So we just, yeah, shoulder in, shoulder a in, and you're pretty much there. So that's pretty good. You can straighten your wrist a little bit, but you're in enough shoulder-wise. ROV nav. Maybe just come up a hair. See the nip cam how it's a little down. Yeah, I think slowly release. Uh, we're in the middle of that. collecting yeah. a sample. Could we wait a couple minutes? I'll give you a call yeah. when we're ready. Thank Sorry you. Stand by. All right, retracting drawer. Thank you. Nicely done. Thank you. Thanks for the help. Nice job, Thank gentlemen. you, pilot. That was great. Rockle center. Or I'll follow you over. Yes. Um, could I ask which uh, suction basket that went into? C5. C5. Thank you. Yes. And that is the fine filter, just for reference. Perfect. Thank you. How's that look, Sean? Looks great. Copy. Secure. Right. The, down. the bridge was requesting to uh, change heading to uh, 225. If now is a good time, I'll uh, let them know. Yeah. Works for us. All right. All right. Well, hopefully we got enough of what you need bridge to do. Bridge ROV nav. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, it looked like you had uh, yeah, you can go at least two or three of those cup carls in a whole time. bunch Thank of sediment. You. So that was a perfect sample. Thank Excellent. you. You're welcome. All right, I will put my camera back, and then I just need to put my uh, swing arm outboard. Copy that. Back I'll uh, lift off and back away from the wall a little bit. Give yeah, some room. sounds good. Coming up. Back away a little bit more from the wall there. Yeah, that should be good there. Copy. If you're ready for it. Ready for swing arm. Upper swing arm deploying back out. Yeah, thanks for the lighting. That helped a lot. It makes, yeah, it can make all the difference. If you're just joining us there. here today, we are on dive six of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Expedition North Atlantic Stepping yeah, Stones, and we are currently right, diving today on back. Castle Rock Seamount up in the Control northern right, quarter off. of the Corner Rise Seamount area. We are currently at so about 2,179 five, meters, five, five and we're kind of working um, our way up a, a steep face, yeah, hoping to get up to about 2,000 meters at the kind of edge of the, the top plateau of the seamount. We just stopped to collect some fossilized corals. These fossilized corals can uh, tell us lots of things about the, the history of this uh, this seamount and the animals that live there. Right they there record reference. climate in their yeah. skeletons and they can stick around on the seafloor for a very long time afterwards. So some of those fossils that we collected uh, might be 10,000, 20,000 or even 100,000 years old. As we go up this uh, pillow lava field here, this is uh, very similar to the habitats that we've been seeing through this little portion of the dive. There are these beautiful stalked yellow crinoids, uh, a few different species of sponge here. Um, and I can see some Chrysogorgia as well, which is a soft coral and octocoral. Um, there's some black coral here as well on this rock that's right in front of us on this big pillow. We've really been observing some beautiful deep sea communities today. I guess, uh, Rian, maybe you have a better view. The brownish branching thing on the back side of that rock, is that just a dead sponge? That's a dead coral, dead coral framework, Scott. Dead coral. Yep. Thank you.
Yeah, it looks like an old uh, octocoral of some kind that is now covered over in the, that ferromanganese coating. If we could have a snap zoom on the coral in the center, Pilot, just for a quick ID. Sure. Thank snap you. Snap zoom video, please. Was it uh, this one here, watch lead, or north of here? Up, up left. Uh, up, uh, there right it is. There. Yep, right there. Actually, that was a sponge. Okay, come on in. Yeah, Chrysogorgia. I don't see this one with its little shrimp. Or a brittle star. Or, um, sorry, a, a squat lobster, which we often see inside these. Perfect. Thank you, pilot. You're welcome. Thanks, video. Some of these very uh, elkhorn-shaped sponges, which we uh, collected a little bit of earlier, because that's an unknown sponge, though it is seen fairly commonly in this area. Could we zoom in, pilot, on the white in the sediment? It's just the right-hand side sure. of a yellow crinoid. I don't know if that's a, just a sponge that has fallen over or something else. Sure. Come on in, video. Thank you. I'll rotate. Yeah, it looks like a sponge that has fallen over and is, uh, you know, fairly recently and is being covered over with sediment here. Thank you, pilot. Thank you, video. Looks like we have another minute or so before the ship completes its heading change. Yeah, I think uh, once they're done, Maybe one more move at this direction. Okay. And then it might start curving that way. I'm not sure. What uh, bearing is that? Pilot watch lead. Go ahead, watch lead. I'm wondering if this uh, pillow that's collapsed here, whether this is a good edge to try and break a coral, uh, break, um, sorry, break a rock. We can certainly give it a poke. See if that, uh, that might come loose. Copy that. Yeah, stand by. Uh, we're looking west. It's always hard to tell, but it looks more fragile than the one we tried earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you think, co-pilot? Where's a good spot to sit down here? Maybe on the left side? Um, Don't want to yeah. land on the sponge there. I think right around there looks pretty good. Copy that. Might be within reach, hard to tell. Yeah, I think you got that. Copy. Oh, and there's a little cup carl sitting on the rock right there, too. <laughs> Maybe have a look at that after we try this uh, rock sample. Maybe a little too much forward there. Well, looks like it's pretty stable. Yeah. 
still moving just slightly, stand by. I think that's good. Alright, um, hydraulics are up. Okay. I will put the mini Zeus up for okay. you. I'll look at the craft. Thank you. Yeah, get you ready. Thank you, Copilot. Stand by. I'm coming on. Bridge ROV nav. Indexing in. Three, two, Are we one. close to completing that heading change? Copy that, thank you. The ship should be stable now. Copy, Copy thanks, that. Matt. I'm just going to center up with the uh, mini zeros. Copy that. Holding there. I'm just going to go down into this hole here and we can probe around the rim here. Yeah, there's a suggestion it might be worth trying to grab a piece and try and twist twist it off or pull it up and see if it comes. Oh uh, yeah, unfortunately watch late the, it's one of the things Kraft strongly discourages with the robotic arm is to grab rock of unknown hardness and durability and try to twist it. That's uh, one of the things that could really damage the arm so we avoid that usually. So the best we can do is kind of tap it with still a lot amount of force but we're not using the jaws to potentially try to squeeze something that's not going to come loose. Did you copy that watch lead? I did not, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry watch lead. I'll say this again, I didn't have you latched. Um, Kraft, the manufacturer of this arm, actually discourages uh, squeezing, uh, for example, rocks like this of unknown hardness and durability. Um, that's one of the things that can really damage the arm. Um, so the best we can do in a situation like this is just apply, it's still a lot of force, um, on it with the fingers, but we typically avoid using the claws to close on uh, rock like this in any type of twisting. That's one of the things that could really damage the arm. Yeah, it looks like this might be pretty rigid as well, unfortunately. The rocks do not want to give up their secrets. We can try that. Copy that, stand by. Rotate the wrist a little. We can definitely try giving it a poke. Uh, scraping it a little bit, but no, no big chunks, huh? Doesn't appear to be. Let's try this little piece over here. Nope, pretty rigid. Yeah, I think that's a great try, pilot. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sorry about that. That's okay. All we can do is try sometimes. Say the seafloor did not want to give up its secrets for you. All right, back up. Thank you. For the geologists. But we'll keep an eye out for loose pieces uh, as we move along our track here. Oh, just give Jaws a quick twist. Yep, we got it. Thank you. Good. Uh, yeah, looks good. Copy. Coming off. Stowed here. Right, we'll draw this one down. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep keep looking for you, watch lead. Absolutely. Let's uh, continue on with our transect and uh, cover a bit of ground here and see what's uh, what's around. But we'll keep eyes open for any loose pieces. Copy that. And, uh, Lifting off. Thanks, copilot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you feel about a move? 260. 260 sounds great. Yeah, do you want to do... Do you want to do 20? It looks pretty... Looks like it's leveling out yeah. a lot more. Let me You're take extended, a peek up real meters. quick. I think 20 would be fine. It's definitely 
more gradual here, so let's do it. Copy that. Bridge ROV nav. I'd like to request a move, range two zero meters, bearing two six zero degrees. There's a ton of Speed these uh, stroke crinoids knots. in this area, and uh, in the scientific chat room we have going here, we had a, a nice uh, a story by Good copy. Uh, Thank Charles you. Messing, Chuck Messing, who uh, mentioned and reminded us that, of course, one of the very first organisms that was pulled out of the deep sea was a stalked crinoid, and this uh, this came at a time where the deep ocean was thought to be lifeless, uh, uh, impossible of supporting any life, and the stalk crinoid really got people thinking that there might be uh, uh, ancient animals that lived in the deep sea, because of course they had found fossils of, of crinoids at that time, so they knew that crinoids existed um, uh, back, in, back in history, and so this got people interested in going out and exploring the deep ocean yeah. and seeing yeah, if life really yeah, lived here. Degrees, and we can see today that uh, the deep ocean is, is incredibly far from lifeless. In this one picture here, we have crinoids, we have a couple of species of coral, uh, sponges, and all kinds of other small organisms that are all over those rocks. Every time we've zoomed in, we've seen uh, worms and small crabs, other sponges, all kinds of other life living in these deep sea communities. Beautiful. more of these pillows that have cracked in over time, filled with sediment. Yeah, what, what can happen with those is that uh, the crust, the outside crust forms, but, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fill in with uh, additional volcanic material so often it can, uh, you can get these sort of empty pillows. Um, if you have some sort of backflow or um, you, you just had enough to make the crust. Um, so, uh, so we get these kind of deflation uh, tube-like features. So this is roughly what we've Another great view, uh, looking kind of along the flank of the seat mount. And how to, to visualize what it actually looks like when you're you kind of pointed directly towards uh, uh, the sea mount as you go up it, it um, really sort of stunning uh, views from side to side you can really see the slope that it isn't always obvious so just like it's it's difficult to measure things without the lasers uh, it's often hard to get that 3d perspective of the sea mount so these side-to-side -side views are really are really useful. Yeah, this is a really beautiful overview right now of showing these these different. Uh, we're kind of on this almost ridge feature with these large pillows and the sediment. And it's really it's great to see the overall topography. It gives you a good visual of of what the lay of the land, the landscape looks like. Starting to smooth, but you're still pretty far out. Copy that. I'm gonna. Just how much light the, the D2 has on it to uh, to see that far into the distance. Uh, there's no light down here, only what we bring ourselves. So, um, being able to see that far into the distance shows you what kind of you know, engineering is is required um, to get these views. It's really amazing looking down into that where we've come and then up this slope leading up towards the top of this uh, seamount feature. That. Thank you. We're hoping to get a little bit closer to today. It's really it's a beautiful overview. Thank you, pilots. You're welcome. And we were just waiting for the ship move get underway there, so I think we have a little more tether now. 
Yeah, I think ship just stopped, right? The ship stopped, yes. Good. Yeah, Cirrus is definitely moving. Um, yeah, it's catching up. 260. You're lined up nicely. Yeah, after this, it might be rotating a little more like that. As far as slope goes, we'll see once I get up there a little closer and inspect. Copy that. Yeah, a little more northeasterly. Or, sorry, northwesterly. Yeah. Yeah, we can certainly change bearing after this. If you'd like. Wow, well, here's a whole field of these sea lilies. <laughs> Look how many there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I, you know, I lose count as I get to the top. There's uh, just a ton of these beautiful sea lilies on these uh, crinoids on star stalks. It's 35 degrees there. Copy. sponges in amongst here as well, including that large elkhorn shape that we uh, collected a little of earlier because it's an unknown species for this area. These beautiful Eridagorgia, uh, uh, Magnus spiralis. Some more Chrysogorgia here as well and some black corals. We've really seen quite a number of coral and sponge species today during the dive so far. And this dive started at 2,358 meters, and we're now at 2,163 meters. So we've come up started. about 200 meters so far. Uh, see what sonar looks like. Sure. Let me go to 280 and see what that looks like. Copy that. Let's see, you're looking. 26, yeah, I think 280 might be a good. Good one for next move. Copy that. Pilot, this is Watch Leap. Go ahead, Watch Leap. Could we snap zoom on the center here? I kind of see there might be a coral sticking up. Sure. It kind of blends into the background a little bit. Go see what you're talking about. Yeah. Video, could we go for a snap? This guy right here, Watch Yeah, Leap. that one right there. I think this is another black coral. Yes, this is a black coral. Potentially another parent had to para antipathies. And I think it had a crinoid sitting at the base, so it seems like everything during this dive has a crinoid sitting somewhere on it. Let's see if we can pan down. Yeah, beautiful. Down. Such tiny little polyps. Yeah, there's the crinoid. And another one. Two crinoids. Nice. <laughs> Blends so well into the background. Yeah, this is great to see. This um, this dive has been the first time that we've seen this particular coral so far on this expedition. Thank you so much, pilots. No problem. Thank you, video. Are you still feeling the uh, move, Sean? I think I'm about done. Copy that. So I think we could do another. How do you feel? This that looks pretty clean. Two eight zero. I think two eight zero. Another twenty meters looks pretty good. Copy that. Works for me. Bridge ROV nav. I'd like to request a move. Range two zero meters. Bearing two eight zero. Speed decimal two knots. Good pad, I put suction back on six. It's all like sponges and more fields sure. of these crinoids, these it's yellow like crinoids on stalks. Copy that. Go watch two. Not this Bridge, shift. did you copy that? Yeah, we could absolutely. Sorry copy. about that. I had some uh, standby. Copy that. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. We were coordinating with the bridge there. 
Um, you were saying introductions? Yeah, I think we can do a round of quick introductions while we're waiting for the ship to get underway there. Are you ready? I wonder as we continue up slowly. Hello, everybody. If, uh, My name is Jonathan Metz. We'll start to see more sediment. It seems like uh, today on this shift. We crashed I'm out of that really steep member of Global uh, Foundation for uh, section where some of those walls were vertical. Right? Yes. Um, no and have moved into an area with more sediment. You know, we're, we're still seeing these kind of uh, pillow lava. Copy that. Uh, morphology, the rock outcrop, but uh, more sediment filling in the crevices between them. So. Go watch it. You know, maybe indicating that uh, as we start to, uh, the gradient of the slope starts to get a little lower, we'll start to see more sediment oh, covering yeah, the rock. Um, it looks like I'm just listening on OK. Okay, X, yeah, so I, I can dial that in whenever we do These it again. finally seem to be very happy here. Stand by. All right, folks, so for those of you that are just joining us at home, uh, we are joining you here from the Cornerized Seamounts, and we're going to do a round of introductions for our team here on the ship and our folks on shore. So why don't we start in our front row? Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Mefford. I'm an engineer with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Being your pilot on this shift, to my right. Sean Kennison, sitting co-pilot. Then navigator seat. Uh, Jim Myers, navigator. Over on the far right-hand corner, Bob not on video. And on Clipper, Art Howard. And sitting in the watch lead seat, this is Rian Waller from the uh, University of Maine as the biology science lead. And I'm Casey Cantwell, the Expedition Coordinator with NOAA Ocean Exploration. Uh, who else do we have joining us on the phone today? Uh, Jason Jada, U.S. Geological Survey, a research geologist. I am the uh, geology co-lead. Hello, everybody out there on the ocean. Uh, this is Scott France. I'm a deep sea biologist at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, the Department of Biology, and serving as the uh, science advisor for the Okeanos Explorer yeah. um, Atlantic Spire campaign. And, uh, really loving so these dives. Looks great. Thanks, guys. All right. And then uh, joining us from the chat today, we have um, Bramley Merton. Cindy Van Dover, uh, James Aubrey, uh, Kelsey Viator, uh, Les Watling, Mike Vecchione, Bob Carney, Apashna Ganguly, um, and a couple other folks that have kind of been flittering in, in and out today. Um, one of the things that I think is so special about how we conduct operations out here is that our team on shore is actually so much bigger than the team that we have on board the ship. We pretty much that. are able Thank to you. use the same telecommunications technology that people use at home to um, stream video, to listen to music, to basically bring science to people at home and to enable everyone to join in deep sea exploration with us, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a, a double mission, really. One, we're bringing this to you in your living rooms and offices, being able to watch us. And the other is we have this whole scientific community that is also uh, watching this this video live and, and helping us in the background here as uh, Casey just mentioned there's this scientific chat room and uh, this is filled from people all over the globe we have people from the UK and Japan and Russia uh, all over the US New Zealand sometimes uh, chiming in and, and helping us um, to identify animals on the seafloor to identify seafloor features and then to identify um, the best samples that we could possibly take to help us really characterize this area and investigate new species in these new areas. And so this, uh, this research cruise is, is so much more than just us sitting out here on the NOAA, uh, NOAA vessel Okeanos Explorer. It, uh, it really belongs to so many more people than, than just us. A couple more names that have joined us here in the chat room since uh, last time I looked down. Um, we have Pierre Josso and Hannah Miller, and Vonda Warham-Hayes. And again, 
just more and more people to keep joining us in throughout the dive. And sometimes people join us for an hour or two and sort of add some scientific comments to the our chat room or to our, annota- our cloud-based annotation system or here on the line. They help us narrate. And sometimes people are here for the whole dive. And it sometimes just depending on their um, time zones that they're in, they're joining us early in the morning before they go to work or a little bit before maybe the kids come home for the day um, from school. So it's it's a pretty special way to conduct operations. Yeah, absolutely. If anything, it kind of helps that we have people on different time zones because we, then we do tend to have a good cohort of scientists here with us throughout the day, um, helping us to identify these new species and, and look at these seafloor features. Pilot watch lead. Go ahead, watch. If we could have a zoom in. There's a white, I think it's a sponge, kind of on the rock central to us there. It's right on the edge. Might be an anemone. Just a little snap zoom to ID would be great. Go for snap zoom, please. Thank you, video. Oh, yeah, and this is one of those sponges that we saw at the beginning. This is a polymastia sponge, which uh, is a little sneaky. It looks a little like a sea cucumber or even a a nudibranch. Um, And right next to it, actually, is this beautiful worm. This is a, a tube worm, this little fan coming out the top. And these are both uh, filter feeders. So they're both picking out water, part- water particles um, out of the out of the water for their nutrients. Particularly like this sponge because it looks a little bit like a hedgehog. It's <laughs> very cute. Thanks so much, pilot. You're welcome. Thanks, video. Ship move still underway, Nev? No, the ship has stopped. I copy that. Are you still settling up, Copilot? I can still move a little bit, but copy that. Probably another minute we could do another move. Sounds great. Staying with 280. We'll see cucumber in the center here we'll at the bottom. Cucumber there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Caught you there, uh, Jason. Uh, look up yeah, that one second delay. Yep. Big faces, <laughs> just lots of oh. geology. Yeah. yeah, lots of geology is another one of those uh, Iridogorgia, those giant yeah. corals yeah. that tower above D2, that and D2 good. stands at about 11 feet, so that's really saying something when a coral towers above it. And again, these fields of crinoids. This dive has really been dominated by these crinoids. We've seen several different species, but these yellow ones on stalks are really common. My um, goodness, it looks yeah, like another field the up in the top view as well. It's amazing. Feet, so. Sound good, pilot? That sounds good. Thanks, Nev. Right. Bridge ROV Nav. I'd like to request a move range two zero meters, bearing two eight zero degrees, speed decimal two knots. Co-pilot, if it's okay with you, if you guys are feeling safe, I'd like to Good copy. Thank you. have you guys shut down your outer lights. And Can we zoom in ones, on the white that's effect. just going to get close to uh, center yeah, here? I think it's a sponge. Pilot, and I can that. gain it Thank up you. so you can see the same. Yeah. Video, can we go for a zoom here on the center screen sponge? Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep, this looks like another frayed sponge of some kind, and of course, there is a crinoid sitting on it. <laughs> it's definitely been the story of the day. All of these sponges and corals and coral stalks having uh, these crinoids on top. This has really been fields of crinoids today. Why would a crinoid be sitting on top of a sponge? So these crinoids uh, like to pick particles out of the water. They're what's known as suspension feeders, and so they like to be up in the current. Um, if you're very, very close to the seafloor, the current really slows down. You don't get quite as much food if you stay down there, and so a lot of these organisms that we see on top of these sponges and corals are really trying to get up in the water column, so to pick out particles and to be able to feed. And uh, oh, yeah. this, uh, this crinoid is, is no different. Thank you so much, Pilot. No problem. Come on out with you. Yeah. All right, there's a request, if it's okay with you, to uh, turn off outer bank serious lights. Sure. Video would then gain it up to get the same visibility. Yeah. If that's okay with you. I think that's fine. Thank All right. you. All right, video. Outer and of course, we're still keeping off. eyes out as well for uh, for rocks. So far, we have uh, the rocks have been refusing to give up their secrets today. Still have good visibility of the tether. Yeah. Yeah. Decent. Z looks pretty good. Copy that. 
every time it's close. And those who who only just joined us and haven't uh, seen us on the dives uh, so far, you notice this great lumpy texture on all these rocks. Um, that that uh, is is caused by the precipitation of uh, ferromanganese. Uh, uh, which is iron and manganese minerals, plus a whole range of other uh, minerals that are, are dissolved into the water column um, that over time accumulate on these rocks very slowly, about a one millimeter per million years. And you get some really interesting uh, textures on the surface of the rocks. Uh, this is a petroidal texture, uh, so it's grape-like or bubbly, uh, and that that indicates, uh, as, as mentioned in uh, the chat room uh, several days ago, uh, that, that is an indication of the, the, the strength of uh, the current in an area. So this texture tends to occur where there isn't uh, a strong current flowing through. Sure. Um, so these uh, minerals precipitate out onto nuclei, which could be a sand grain, it could be a terrapod shell, it, it could be a coral fragment, could be something that's sitting on the, the rock surface, and, and you generate all these individual little bumps. Um, and because I started talking about geology, another interesting coral arrived. Hey, video, do you have me? And it's Carl here. They're about to zoom on. We're going to go for a snap zoom when you get settled. Thank you. This is a metallogorgia. Metallogorgia. We, yeah. We saw a juvenile one of these earlier that still had polyps coming down the down the stalk. This one is, you can kind of see some of the, the old stalks that are there that have broken away. But this one would be classified as an adult. Um, and you can see the brittle star wrapped really tightly around the center there. I love these particular corals. They look like little mini umbrellas in the seafloor. It's definitely like something out of Dr. Seuss sometimes when you, you cross these areas. So many deep sea corals look like something out of Dr. Seuss. They do, they really do. And this is, this is a big one. <laughs> so there's something interesting about this brittle star and perhaps Rian, either you or someone else might be able to tell us a little bit about this, the relationship between the brittle stars and the metallogorgias. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Scott actually addressed this earlier when we saw the, the juvenile one, and I should say the, the brittle star is Ophiocreus, um, an Ophiocreus uh, uh, brittle star. And what's really interesting about these is when we see that they're juveniles, very often there's a juvenile um, brittle star in the middle as well, and so it's like these two grow together. As the coral grows, the brittle star is also growing, and so it's really this wonderful, uh, wonderful symbiotic relationship between these two. How do they find another cool each thing other? about that brittle star? Oh, sorry, Casey. No, no, go ahead, Scott. Uh, another cool thing about that. <laughs> I love this delay. Another cool thing about the brittle star is that the arms are really, really long. We usually see them kind of coiled here, and um, maybe instead of coiling, we should say draped. It's kind of like they drape it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth over a branch, and so that is uh, easier, I would say, than if it was coiled uh, 360 around the branch to. Uh, unfurl, and those arms are long enough that it should certainly be able to reach all parts of the upper branches. Um, I'm not sure how far down the stalk goes, but um, another, bit, yeah. you know, another suggestion to the hypothesis that the presence okay. of this brittle star is beneficial to the coral because it is feeding on larvae and other small things that may land on the metallogorgia. Do you get enough so on that uh, watch lead, or do you want to keep the colony clear imagery? of other things that would want to be in it? We've seen lots of corals okay. where there are all kinds of organisms in that are crawling light, yeah. over it trying to get up in the water column. Yeah. On metallogorgia, you don't usually see anything else but this brittle star, maybe occasionally um, on a possum shore. So how do they find each other? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, are you muted? I, you know, yes, I'd love I to was. be able to design an <laughs> experiment to test that. I have to Edward wait uh, several decades into the future, but to, uh, surely it, it must be that there is some chemical that is released from the metallogorgia coral that the larva of the brittle star can sense. Um, but what amazes me one is, you know, you can see we only see one of them here. That's an awful lot of space for a larva to have to um, travel. But you know, I otherwise, so a, lo a long way to travel and a lot of space to look to find so that one metallogorgia. And remember, it's going to find it when it's extremely small, I mean, you know, two inches. 
Copy uh, that. Paul. So out. Yeah. I can't the think of a way that the larva of the coral and the it's larva of there, the brittle star would travel together. If anybody can <laughs> think of some mechanism for that, that would be really cool. <laughs> so it's got to be a situation where um, you know that larva is detecting it later on. And I suspect maybe it's a situation where if a larva doesn't find the metallogorgia, then possibly those young metallogorgia die and don't grow. So that's why we never see those ones. We only see the successful events of where the um, brittle star has found its metallogorgia. It's definitely amazing to think of those larvae. Um, so a lot of the animals in the deep sea do something called broadcast spawning, where they're actually producing many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of larvae, and they broadcast them out into the water column, and the currents take them, take them away. Um, and so when you think of how many of those might be successful out of, you know, 1,000, 10,000, even 100,000 of those larvae, it might just be one or two or maybe even none that find that metallogorgia when you're having to have this symbiotic relationship. So it's, it's really curious, and I'd love to know if there was a way um, that we could figure out if these larvae are actually transported in the same currents. Do they spawn at the same time? And that allows their eggs to, to follow each other and at least have a chance um, of, of landing near each other. It's a really fascinating relationship, and it's quite extraordinary and really unknown how that happens. Do you think they, uh, uh, you know, because they, they're they essentially paired together, that there's some sort of signaling that goes on, you know, in their adult phase prior to the, the, the lava being released? Potentially, yes. You know, we've certainly found um, a lot of shallow water coral species and, and other other invertebrates uh, have chemical cues um, that can either attract larvae or even keep them away from adult forums saying, you know, don't settle here. This is my patch. Um, and so it's it's absolutely certainly possible um, that that could be the case. Sorry, Nav. When did the last ship move in? Uh, I have not received confirmation. I'll check on it right now. Copy. Bridge ROV nav. Copy that. Thank you. Yeah, the move is complete. Copy that. Thanks, Nav. Still feeling pretty good about 280 copilot. Yeah, this looks good. I think this, I don't know what that is, but it's not real. So I think we're still looking. Is that a sea cucumber pilot at the very bottom, or is that a rock that looks like a sea cucumber? <laughs> <laughs> Let's <laughs> take a quick look. As, as we've gone over it, I think it might be a rock that looks like yeah. a sea cucumber. <laughs> I think you're right. Can I, though? That'd Very be a new one for sure. <laughs> I'm on rock spotting patrol, apparently. We'll call it a rock cucumber. A rock cucumber. Look at that. It, does. it looks just like a cucumber. Thank you, pilot. You're welcome. Come on out, video. Thanks. I see that you zoom in and show that, you know, the sediment is, is a fairly significant component of the larger stuff is uh, probably this uh, ferromanganese crust pieces that are that broken off and are, are small and are starting to accumulate with the rest of the sediment. Can go for a quick zoom on this. So, go ahead, video. We, we may get lucky and, and see a crust Here's piece we can uh, grab around this area. Video pilot, could we go for a quick zoom here? Yes, I think we definitely want to keep eyes open for any loose rocks in this area to get that, that sample of that crust that's so important for the Thank geology you. of this region. Yeah, quick zoom, please. Some of these beautiful tubular sponges, and I actually see some brittle stars sitting around the top of the one at the, the bottom end there. You can just see their pink arms, or well, maybe it's a singular one with really long arms. It's hard to tell from this angle. Can try to do a little movement around it. Really see the internal structure of the the sponge there, looking down in the hole in the top. Quite pretty. Oh, and some little baby crinoids there. Mm 
You can come on out, video. That's great, pilot. Thank you. You're welcome. See in the blue view, in the lighting, mm -hmm. like how well it matches, just from the shading. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. The blue view. Do you want me to put in a move? Yeah, pilot. How do you feel about another 20 meters at 280? That sounds great. Open camera. Just large. Uh, that's 45 degrees. Goblet like uh, sponge Copy in front case. of us. Are we full wide video? Ah, copy that, thanks. I'll come up a little bit if you want to come full wide. Bridge ROV nav. I'd like to request to move. Range 20 meters, bearing 280 That was another degrees, metallic gorgia sitting out by that sponge knots. there. Really quite hidden until you catch them quite close on the cameras. Good copy, uphill. thank you. But, uh, we've seen several of those now. Nice. Oh, looking uphill, look at this. Steady slope here. Losing a lot of the uh, boulders in this area. Yeah, lots of cracked edges to keep an eye and see if there are any loose rocks kind of underneath those edges. Copy that, watch Lee. Thank you. I think there's a sea urchin there, a bright white sea urchin. Bottom of you there? Or, uh, oh, over there. Kind of in the bottom. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Can looks, go for a zoom here. Looks a little like the uh, the red, either formosoma or hygrosoma that we saw earlier. It has kind of that more flattened shape rather than a really round and spherical. Beautiful. If you watch really closely, you can see the two feet on this uh, sea urchin moving, and that's what helps them move along the, the sea floor. And they have um, a mouth area on the underside that has this special structure. It's called an Aristotle's lantern, and it's made of teeth, uh, five teeth that all work together. And they usually will, will pick particles or scrape partle, particles off rock or in the, the sediment. And you can really see the, the structure there called ossicles, and you can really see the structure of those ossicles on this one. It's really pretty. Thank you so much, Pilot. No problem. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Continuing to move at 280 here. Slowly uphill. I have a good feeling about this little area here for finding a rock. I was just going to say the same thing. This looks like a good area potentially to find a, a loose rock a, up in the top right hand quadrant of the screen potentially. Copy that. I said that obviously because when we say things, it, it happened. Right. <laughs> Hasn't it been that we should say, ah, oh, we're never going to get a rock, and then suddenly a rock will appear? That, that seems to be, uh, yeah. It's so hard to tell if these rocks are loose or whether they're part of the pavement with just sediment covering over them. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that they're, they're pretty well embedded. We're seeing a lot of... Uh, ferromanganese uh, across debris scattered around on the sediment, which uh, may be due to some abrasion of, of downslope um, moving uh, you know, sediment flows. Here's a big area of really coarse cool sediment. I'm not sure if it's all, if it's a mix of terabods and uh, volcanic plastic type material, some iron manganese uh, across to pieces. Sure. You know, we're not empty. too far below the, the summit platform, so we may be seeing, uh, you know, the result of, of the, the stronger currents and other. Uh, oh. Oh, it looks like we're seeing the top of a, a rock outcrop that's just covered with you know, these pteropods, these sea butterfly shells. Um, but there's a lot of them. 
An awful lot of them, and some Xenophyophores, and I see some brittle stars, all kinds of things in there. Thank you, pilot. No problem. Next video. Pilot clip. Copy that, thank you. So, Rian, what yeah. is a Xenophyophore? You just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, so a Xenophyophore. Kind of a mouthful <laughs> if you don't know what you're talking about. It wow. is a Xenophyophore. So, a Xenophyophore is actually it's a single celled organism, but they produce almost this. Um, I don't know, they, they range from kind of uh, half a tennis ball all the way up to people were, were saying on the chat room a few days ago that can even be a kind of grapefruit size. And they build this mucus structure and they bring in sand particles and grains. Um, and that, that just provides them a home. But it's kind of amazing that you have this single celled organism that can be, you know, 10 centimeters big. They're really very, very unusual creatures. So Jason, we just passed an area of, that you were calling coarse sediment. Why, why would that, why would the sediment have changed suddenly in that little flow? Um, in, in this case, uh, you know, it, it, the 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 seamount is is essentially seeing the same uh, sediment origin. So most of this sediment, we're just talking about terrapod shells and and. Uh, and, and some of these other marine organisms. So the bulk of this sediment, the kind of whiter colored material, is uh, is living in the water column. And when it dies, their shells, um, and for the pteropods, we call them tests, um, you know, fall to the bottom and begin to accumulate. Um, and there's a number of other uh, planktonic uh, uh, organisms that, that do the same. So we get a big accumulation of, of yeah. uh, material falling out of the water column. We don't get much sediment from terrestrial or uh, land areas just because we're so far away uh, that most of that material is uh, sediment. It, it, it's sedimented out uh, long before it would get to here. Um, so in terms of the coarseness, um, you know, as we approach the top of this seamount, um, we may be experiencing, uh, you know, a, a higher current flows um, that uh, may be conducive for actually transporting material that, that gets deposited downslope, and that uh, as it passes over over these lumps and bumps, that these volcanic lava flows are are, are forming, they kind of get trapped uh, like riffles. So. You know, you can see that uh, in front of the rocks, it, it, it's not as coarse, but on the back side uh, of the rocks, it, it, it's a little coarser. So, it can, you know, it, it's just a way of, uh, of all the sediments kind of, ultimately, all the sediments want to be at the bottom of the female, uh, just from a, a gravitational kind of uh, relationship. But uh, they, they tend to get Do trapped on the way down. Sampled? Do we have in the bio boxes? Um. In so the pilots here are just going to have a look and see whether any of these rocks are loose, and we're also going to take a sample of this you yellow crinoid because we're like not quite sure what that species is, and it's really abundant in this area, so it's really indicative, a, a, a good example of the kind of organisms that live in this area here. I think we're stable here, co-pilot? Uh, yeah. This looks good. I can put the RVHD2 down. Perfect. Yeah, there's nothing about its uh, swimming ability. Copy that. <laughs> that was at the port bio, back, bio box, Neff? Port inner. Port inner, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Nothing about swimming. That's good to know. So plenty of room. We'll have to see if the uh, drawer will open or not, but... Are you going for rock first? I think we'll go for rock first. Yeah, sounds good. That way we can just wing inboard and... Open the drawer. I'm going to give the rock a poke first. Yep. Okay. Bringing on the hydraulics now. Hydraulics are up. Copy that. Nibbling. Arm is live. Indexing in in three, two, one. I'll follow you out the mini. Copy that. Center you up there. 
Thank you. All right, now for the test. Uh -oh. Let's try to drag it, I guess. Ooh, that is stuck, huh? Yeah, it looks like it might be, unfortunately. I'm moving a little bit. Let's see. Might need to stabilize. Stand by. Try to maybe try the ones behind it. Yeah, potentially. This set kind of looks cemented. Yeah. Let's try to sit down right here. Yeah, we can certainly give it a try here. Coming up. You think in this one back here, Sean? Looks like in one of those three. Oh. Yeah. Those look more promising than the ones in the... I'm thinking below that one. Well, yeah, try that one. But yeah, it seems stuck. Yeah. Maybe this guy. Hmm. Nope. Don't think so. Hmm. What about this guy right here? Yeah, give me a shot. Most likely not, but... Keep pushing the ground, sorry. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look like it wants to move. Let's try from this angle. I think that's the last one that looks, might be loose to me. Yeah. I guess the one in front of that one. Yeah, it's in there. Let's try to get it from in front of it. Doesn't appear to be. No. Yeah, those all look stuck. Hmm. The rocks are still refusing to budge. Sorry about that watch lead. Doesn't look like they're going to come out. Okay. Yeah, if we could um, grab the yellow crinoid, that would be great. Copy of that. And then we'll uh, just keep our eyes back up a little here, huh? Yeah, exactly. Keep our eyes open Copy for uh, boxes. rocks. Maybe back up a foot or two. We still be, should still be in reach. Yeah, I haven't. Hey, watch it. For the previous sample in the port bio box, was that also a crinoid? Yes, yeah, so that was, um, it was a sponge with two crinoids in, on it, and that went into the port inner. Were those crinoids swimmers by any chance? Is that a, should we keep that box closed, or do you think they'll stay put? Those, uh, yeah, those ones in that bio box could potentially be swimmers. This one will not swim, um, so it would be better if this could go in the starboard, I guess. Understood. Thanks. Thank you. I'll make a note of that. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Let me uh, pivot here a little bit. We're not quite stable. Yeah, no worries. So probably what I'll do is might still, I think you could snip it, but afterwards you might have to back up a little bit. Okay. So I think you could snip it. And then we'll come up a little bit. Index, yeah. 
Or okay. just back up a foot. I think that's all you need. Copy that. And then we'll have to go for the uh, starboard side. Okay. And then before you do it, I'll put your... Swing arms. Swing arm in, down. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Lighter. Copy that. Um, all right. Let's see. Is there um, a particular length of this that you want to acquire your watch lead? Yeah, pilot. If it's possible to get most of the stalk, that's really helpful for most identification. Copy yeah. that. We'll try to position the claw at the base. Thank you. No problem. Coming online. Be able to get it from this angle or not? Uh, you could just back up a hair now if it's too close. Yeah. I think that's usually a pretty good angle. Okay. For snipping it, because then when you come in, you just kind of do this. Copy that. So yeah. Just back up like a foot, and I think that same approach was really good. Copy that. Backing up just a little bit here. And maybe that'll give you enough draw room to... Yeah, it might. Yeah, like right there, I think it'll look really good. Copy that. Let that settle for a second. Seems to be holding well. Yeah, looks good. Copy that. Coming on. Yes, what I would do would um, shoulder outboard a little, and then approach it like that. Okay, we have enough room there, you think? I think it'll be okay, yeah. Copy that. So shoulder out, you thinking? I think, yeah, and then come at it like that kind of angle, because it gives you a good view of it from this camera. But if you came at it the other way, it just blocks the camera a little bit. Copy that. I think I'm elbowed up, or uh, wristed up as much as I can. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so what you could do is, if you shoulder out a little bit more, mm -hmm. and then you can wrist in, you have this function there. Yeah, I think my wrist is fully bent. Yeah, it's as much. You, you can't do this. Let's see. I can do that. But I can't get it level. I can come down. You could approach it like that. From the side? It'd just be angled, but the stock's yeah. long enough that. Okay. Let me try that. Maybe from over here? Yeah, so your wrist comes in. Yeah, yeah that looks a lot that. better. Yeah. As much of an angle as it can get up out of the wrist. Turn down the grip force real quick. Usually three gives you nice, um, I guess, tuning for opening and closing. Copy that. Practice claw here and see how close we are. Wow, 
might be as much of it as I can get there. How's that look, watch lead? That looks great, pilot. Copy that. Flow, no. Might have closed too quickly there. Let's see. Yes. I might be able to salvage it, stand by. It snapped pretty rapidly. It's pretty brittle, yeah. I may not have had enough of the tie gun around it. Going for a little more delicate grab here. Try to feather it. Nope. Just I think I cut it again. Oh, that's super brittle. Yeah, it's just snapping as soon as I touch it. You could try the suction sampler at this part. Yeah, well, actually, um, we could try a suction sampler on it. It will break into pieces. Yeah, um, yeah definitely no for the suction. Sorry about that. It's, uh, it appears to be quite brittle. Yeah, yeah, no, I saw it. It uh, snapped pretty rapidly there. I don't know if I can feather it in. What's left of it? <laughs> Just give it another little try here. Oh, it's quite brittle. I've only got a little piece of that there. Watch lead. I'm not sure if that's sufficient or not. Uh, you know, I think it will make a genetic sample. Um, I think it's worth it and maybe try for the last piece. But yeah. is that possible? Uh, do, do both pieces or should I drop this one and just go for the bigger one? Uh, if you, yeah, take what we have in the hand. Yep. Okay. Thank we, you. We can certainly try for that bigger one as well if you'd like. Our pilot, if you're ready, I can... Uh Oh. Try extending drawer. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me go for that bigger one, actually. Okay, no problem. Uh, we've already yep. lost this one. That one seems to have the mouth parts, so that's a yeah. slightly better sample anyway. Copy that. Sorry about that. Alright, I feel a little better about that one. All right, I'm going to extend the drawer. This pin's retracted, this pin's extended. Copy that. Extend the drawer now. Okay. Index out. It's full extended. Full out. Copy. I will put down the camera a little bit. Thank you. Oh, and let me put your uh, upper swing arm in. Let me stir it real quick. Yeah. And we're going for port inner, is that correct? Port inner. Copy that. It's going to be your best bet. Down a little bit. All right, I'm off camera. Copy. And yeah, it's just kind of. You can pretty much get to like a stow position. Mm -hmm. It's a good starting point. And then you just kind of shoulder down a little bit, and then wrist up. So you can now straighten your wrist out a little bit. See on the minute camera how it's a little off? Yeah. So pretend like you're going for a stow the craft position. Yeah. <laughs> that looks really good. Copy that. And then just rotate over. Rotate over, straighten your wrist out. And then as you shoulder down a little bit, so put your jaws now. Um, yeah, that looks really good. So as you shoulder out, shoulder down, 
Um, it should go right in there. Copy that. And then you can just move it. Yeah, great view right there. Copy that. I think you're just touching the lip there. Copy. Let's just come inboard a little bit. Yep. That's pretty good. That looks great. Yeah. And now just try to release it softly. Yep. And it's a sinker, so it should go right below. Yep. Looks good. It's in the bottom. Copy that. That's starboard inner. Yep. Catch it on the box standby. There we are. All right, retracting. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. You as well. Well, apologies for only getting you a piece of that watch lead. That's okay. That's no problem. That piece is actually still incredibly valuable. It has the mouth parts, which are a major thing that we need for taxonomy and then uh, certainly enough for some genetics. Copy that. Thank you so much, Pilot. You're very welcome. That was definitely a, a rough sample, that one. Very brittle. Didn't make it easy on me, that's for sure. No, I feel like you've had a you've had a hard shift here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant more so that uh, specimen. <laughs> yeah. Quite brittle. How are we looking, Copilot? We... Oh, I gotta bring that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, stand by. Here I can come up a little bit. It's a better view. Thank you. Good there. Copy. Coming up. You got it? Got right. it. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I'm just going to put your upper back out. Yeah, you can see how much darker that gets now. Yeah, yeah, thanks for adjusting the lighting there. That was great. All right, ready for. Coming up. Got both pins retracted. Looks good. All right, hydraulics are off. Disabled. I'll put this camera back. Looks real good. Thanks, go pilot. Then my camera is, I'm kind of on top of you, but not quite. A little behind. Copy that. Good Delta 17. Good heading as well. I'll push up. And if you just joined, joined us today, we're on dive number six of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Expedition, North Atlantic Stepping Stones. Uh, we are diving today on an area called Castle Rock Seamount, which is in the northern end of the Corner Rise Seamounts. We started this dive at 2,358 meters, and we're currently at 2,134 meters. So we've come up just over 200 meters on this dive. Uh, this dive so far has really been dominated by these crinoids, uh, several different species that we've seen, as well as sponges and uh, several species of deep-sea coral that we had yet to see until the dive today. So it's been a, a really good dive um, so far. And it looks like the slope might have turned on us there. Mm -hmm. Let me take a peek. Yeah, I'm nice and stable. You want me to rotate to like back to 260? Yeah. And line that up. Yeah, I like that. Copy that. Rather large rock out there ahead. Yeah. Maybe some good stuff. Alright, that's looking back at 260. Copy. Camera's at four zero right there. Yeah, 
Some more of these big urchins I can see. We actually, when we landed, we saw two of these bright red urchins uh, on the seafloor, and they're either a, a hygrosoma or potentially a formosoma uh, type of sea urchin. So looking about two, four, five. And more crinoids here as well, this real field of crinoids. Looks like I'm in front of you now, which is good. Nice feature right there, I think, right in front of you. See it in yeah. the manip. Looks like it has a lot of items on it. Good spot in the manip there, yeah. Do you want to put Sirius um, 10 meters closer to that? Sure, we can do that. A little more tether to explore. That sounds good. Nav, how do you feel about... So it looks like we're coming up to more gold. We're just under. Uh, two, five, zero. Oh, look at that. Good? It's like a I feel real good about that. It's like a deserted island here. <laughs> With palm trees swaying in the breeze. Like request to move. Range one With zero uh, meters. fireworks going on in the background. Two, there you go. Zero Your degrees. firework, Carl. Speed decimal two knots. Clearly, we might have a good place for uh, just about some of our filter minutes. feeders. Good copy, that. good copy. Thank you. And suspension feeders. Yeah, this is just a great spot. This little. Local high here. Oh, Notice that all the crinards are pointed in the same direction. It is. It's amazing, and they're all facing up, up this uh, feature, which is really interesting. Have they all been pointing in the similar direction when we've seen them throughout the dive, or is this kind of a local thing? I feel like when we've seen two or three together, they've been pointing in the same direction. But this is the first time I remember being on a feature like this where all of them were facing in that single direction. I mean, they can move around on this stall. Yeah, I, don't, so. I don't think I could answer that, uh, Casey. I think it's going to be very dependent on, uh, on the uh, local conditions, because as Rian just said, um, they're mobile. I mean, they can move around and change which direction they're pointing. Yeah, like there's also a Brasingid asteroid, sea star, which is one of those crinoids. Yep, sitting on the seafloor there, in between those uh, those crinoids is another black coral too, and again another one of these beautiful uh, eridogorgias. Wow, look at this rock! <laughs> it does look just like that deserted island with the palm trees. And everything. Yeah. <laughs> yep, coral, coral debris there as well. Do you want to add ten? But no rock piece to be found. No loose rocks. Bridge yeah. yeah. Keep keep our eyes open for those loose rocks in the sediment. That Copy that, watch lead. We've got a minute here, so. Okay. Oh, well, perfect. Then if we could drop down and take a look at some of these rocks, that would Copy be great. That. Thank yep. you. Good time. See if we get lucky here before we change shifts. It's certainly a lot of coral rubble. Those Aridogorgia corals are my favorite coral. And one of our uh, video team members, uh, Caitlin Bailey, frequently refers to them as Aridogorgias. Uh, <laughs> that, makes, that makes good sense. <laughs> Look at this coral rubble as we go down. You can see these big holdfasts that have fallen down from above. Surely one of these rocks has fallen down from above, too. Yeah, those ones coming in the center of the frame. I, I have a good feeling about about those ones. Yep. I had a good feeling about all of them. So <laughs> I don't know what, what that's worth. There's that's true. One in the center there that might be. Loose. Oh, that looks a little on its own, doesn't it? Yeah, suspicious. Uh, the one just under the lasers. Just under the lasers now. Yep, just on the lasers now. Yep. We'll have a closer look. A little hot on the camera there, I think. For the lighting. Or video, I think the, the lighting's a little hot. So the trick and, is... And if that one doesn't work, the dinosaur footprint one over to the sponge. right looks kind of fun. Oh uh, yeah, look at that. It does look like a dinosaur footprint on the right. <laughs> look at that. It's really <laughs> Yeah. Do we think that one is loose? 
Actually, that dinosaur footprint it's, looks really loose on the right hand side. Up. Yeah, it toes. <laughs> um, that should get close enough. Let me come up just a little. There we are. Keep it in view on the minips. And then we'll see if we're in range. Sponge is safely between our arms here. We'll touch down. Might have to go a little bit more forward. Yeah, copy that. Maybe even rotate a little bit here. How about that? Do you think that's going to be in reach, or do we need to go more forward? I think that'll do it. Copy that. Let's settle out here and give the rack a poke. I will pull it. Let's see. Maybe, it two up. Maybe even try to give it a little grab. Hydraulics are on. Thank you, Copilot. <sighs> Enabling arm. It's live. Indexing in. Three, two, one. I'll follow you out. Copy that. Just centered up there. So, you think uh, we should try to nudge it first or just grab it? It's probably nudge it's first. A little nudge, yeah. Copy that, thank you. Mm. Oh! This looks loose. I was going to say that, that moved. <laughs> okay. I think this looks more promising than the last one's watch lead. Excellent. So we can put the, uh, I think we have, a, we have a rock in the, uh, we have one on the starboard side. So we'll need to open the rock box first. Yeah. Okay. Copy. I'll put the camera down. Thank you. And I will inboard the wing. Wings all the way inboard. Copy that. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. All right, I will put the uh, mini Zeus back up. Copy. Set her up on the rock. I'll stop there. Thank you. Try grabbing from. Yeah, that's great. Opening jaws. We're moving, but I think we got it. Yeah, that's good. I'll bring the mini Zeus down. Copy that. Keep him closer. And 
Do we want to have a look at this real quick, watch lead? We can do a quick zoom, but uh, I think we should probably get moving. Copy that. I'm glad to hear that, Jason. <laughs> Sounds like somebody on the line might be happy. Yep. <laughs> He'll take that one, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, we can come out. Created a little bit of storm here. Yeah, I'll go down with the camera a little bit. Copy that. Let me get my wrist lined up. A little murky, but I think we have good enough visibility here. Let it settle for just a second. This is going a little better. How's that looking? Yeah, that looks great. After that. And release. That's good. I'll level up the mini source real quick. Copy that. Thank you. And then you'll just have to Happy. tap the lid shut. Some people go from the side. I can go on, to, on the top and just kind of do mm. this. But copy that. Yeah, whatever feels better. I think just given my current orientation, I'll do this. Nicely done. Thank you. Outboard. Wonderful. Thank you. Nicely done, thank you. You're very welcome. I'll follow you over. Copy. Yeah, thank you, pilot. Promise to not bug you about rock collecting for at least the rest of this time. Wow, that's pretty generous, Jason. I thought you were going to say at least the next five minutes. I was. <laughs> <laughs> but then I looked at the time. But I'm known to not keep my promises like that, so. I think we're pretty good there, yeah? Let's just get just the glare in. off there. Just yeah. yeah, that looks really good. Copy. Hydrox off. That looks good. Stowed. Copy down, HP disabled. I'm good, Jim. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Oh, Nav, I think uh, Washley 2 is hailing you. Nav. Thanks for the help, Capella. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, 49 minutes. All right, so science team on shore um, we have approximately 40 yeah, more nice minutes uh, here on bottom how would you like to spend that so we are approaching sort of the top of this geo um, would you like to sort of make some headway and get to see the top of the geo or would you kind of like to keep moving at the pace that we have right now um, kind of scanning as we go uh, it seems like we've been kind of in the the environment that we're in right now for a little bit, uh, if folks are interested in a change or okay, this has been a super interesting area, we can kind of keep at this pace and here. keep uh, working our way up slope. Tether okay? Yeah, Tether looks great. Copy. Uh, I guess it depends on what that means for 
um, ship move because certainly as soon as we start going faster, we're going to see something new and interesting and then want to stop everything. So um, I guess if I could, I'd vote in between. I agree with you that I feel like we've seen most stuff that we've been seeing for the last uh, hour plus. Um, and so don't need to stop for a bunch of close-ups. But I wouldn't want to go so fast in case we see something really interesting. My opinion. Bit of current, perhaps. Not sure. No, it's not too bad, actually. That's a great point, Scott. I uh, never want to get too fast because, yes, you, as soon as you do, you'll you'll end up uh, seeing something pretty incredible. Looks like some large rocks off to a port here. But generally, do folks agree that we should continue? make our continue making our way up a couple more of those black corals there and more crinoids bring my camera up couple more sponges here um, I'd love for us to be able to get above 2100 meters depth so yeah I mean if we can go fast enough to get that last uh, 20 or 30 meters okay. Okay. Uh, all right let me talk to the pilots yeah, I think we're about ready to push on Go watch two. Apologies, having just said move on, I think you just passed an Akinola on the lower yeah, left. Copy all. Watch two. Um, I think we're about ready to put a ship moving here as well. So. Twenty. Twenty-one hundred meters. Copy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to do, do you sort of point at 270? Sure, 270. I'll rotate a little bit. And um, 20 meters. I think that sounds good. That yeah, sounds great. Great. Sorry, I went a little fast there. Yeah, bridge ROV nav. All right, guys. So the uh, just talked like to the to pilots and move. they Range are um, going to try and keep us moving up slope. Um, shouldn't be going too fast, speed, but um, should be trying to get us up into that shallower than 2,100 meter range. And Rian is back, so and I. Oh, go ahead, Scott. Good copy. Thank you. I apologize. Um, as you were just talking with the pilots, there, I think we may have just missed um, an uh. Akinella. I wasn't 100% sure, but we definitely just passed over. A paramaricia, which would be the first for the, both of those would be first for the expedition. Um, so I don't want to go back for anything like that. But just noting that we're starting to see some different things. So just like we predicted. Good to know. Thanks. So Rian is back, yeah. and um, I, I'm sorry, Casey. Yeah, this delay is hard. Um, but we would want to get snap zooms out of them. It can be on the fly if we see them again. Thank you. OK, sounds good. So I have to hop off to go to the operations meeting, um, but Rian is back. And I'm going to give her a little bit of information, and she'll be right with you. So as we keep moving here, uh, it'll be a good uh, idea to kind of look back at where we started. Um, How are you doing? To dive down, I think around you ready to take over? 50 meters. Um, and that was early this morning. Um, and we've been progressing up a sort of a mixed uh, rocky outcrop and, and sediment uh, covered slope. But, uh, the, the slopes are pretty high in places, above 30 degrees. We're now on slopes that are, uh, are more in the 20 degree range uh, as we approach the, the summit platform of uh, Casa Rocina. This is an unexplored uh, seamount, so it's the first time anyone has, that we're aware of at least, has, any, has uh, been down here to look at what uh, the, the geology and biology of this scene out is a little urchin at the bottom of the screen, one of those flat, flatter urchins. We've been seeing a lot of, uh, of the yellow crinoids, so almost a crinoid forest. Um, as, as we move 
uh, I think we started seeing these about the middle of the dive today. Um, certainly, uh, I think it's probably the most abundant fauna that we we come across uh, on the way up. Uh, lots of different uh, volcanic rock textures, primarily basalt. Uh, basalt uh, sorry, primarily pillow lava, uh, but some sheet flows and some some other. Flow types uh, we've noted on the way up. So we're uh, we're now crossing about 21, so 2,115 meters. As you, you you just heard from from Casey, we're hoping to get above 2,100 meters. All right, watch lead. We're going to do a little shift rotation here. Thanks for staying with us here. Stand by. Jason, if we're here for a second, can we get a snap zoom um, to the left of that yellow crinoid sticking yellow. up the wall? Can't tell if it's uh, Chrysogorgia or Aegean Ella. Yeah, Scott, we're just on a watch change right here, so we just have to wait a few moments. Right now, Copy that, thank you. Change happening. Uh, the pilots, navigators, uh, driving us up the sea map the last couple of hours are, are moving on, and a uh, new uh, group is, is taking over. We're just going to hang here for a little bit. If you just joined us, uh, you're, you're joining us today, uh, viewing a uh, Castle Rock Seamount through the camera of the D2 ROV, right from the NOAA ship uh, OKS Explorer. We're working currently in the corner ice seamounts. Uh, we didn't actually get a, a, a distance from the near uh, land mass, but I think it's probably about 750 miles Pilot? Uh, to Bermuda, to the southwest. Go pilot, yeah. Yeah. pilot. Got a really interesting dive. All right, looks like we're uh, Copy that, that we thank haven't you bridge. seen uh, the future. during the, the rest of our dive. Go ahead, watch so that. A little bit shallower than we have been previously. Yes, it was a, a deeper dive than we have done so far. And sure. Today we're, we're just a little bit shallow. Bridge RV uh, now. It's like before. hanging. So. Okay. Aiming down. Yeah, I was wondering if I could get a quick weather update yeah, yeah, or any sounds coming yeah. through. All right, go ahead and come in. Thank you. All right, awesome. Ranger. Thank you, Bridge. Oh, uh, this one right here? That's the one. Yep. Okay. Thank you, co pilot. In, in the biology yeah. and the geology, as you go. This is the one, Scott. No. Yes, Rian, thank you. We can move on. That's a Chrysogorgia. Chrysogorgia, yep. Tell if it's coming from the sediment or from the wall. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you so much, pilot. Sure. We can uh, keep moving. Pilot's clear, the video is. D2 rotator at four. I see another Metallogorgia, which are these kind of umbrella shaped corals sitting up on top. This is just a beautiful view here. Some sponges and. Uh, these uh, sea lilies, which have been so abundant during this dive, for most of this dive, we've seen these fields of these yellow sea lilies, just beautiful. And as several of our scientists on shore have noted, we're really starting to get into a much different fauna than we've seen on our dives previously. And uh, that could be a little bit about uh, the depth that we're at, a little bit about the seamount we're at and the area we're at. That but we're a two seven zero, correct? really starting uh, to see yes. some of the fauna we really most recognize as we get into these upper reaches. Probably stop swinging in the next couple of minutes. Copy. I like, Rian, that you kept the uh, explanation ambiguous, and we really don't know, and it's one of the reasons we're How doing these explorations right and trying to get these first looks at these Six communities so we can start to understand a little bit better what are the distributions of all these animals, well. where do they overlap, where do they differ, how is it related to uh, water mass, depth, location of the seamount, and so on. So every, every time, every day that we get down here on the bottom with the uh, ROV is a, is a great day for learning. 
Absolutely, absolutely, Scott. And I think, uh, I know in, in my experience with ROV dives, I don't think I've ever seen quite a field of sea lilies like we've seen today. It's really quite spectacular uh, and quite different. And starboard outer bio boxes okay. that are empty and then uh, all but jar five and I guess a bit of jar six. Okay, so there are the rock boxes there? Rock boxes both have uh, rocks in them. Understood. And the sample in our port inner bio box has some cryonoids on it, which did not swim away when we collected it, but I guess that could is, potentially. is a potential thing that could theoretically happen. Okay. So port starboard outers, the uh, starboard outer is probably going to be uh, the go-to if there is any, or uh, potentially try and get it in one of the suction jars, so depending on what it is. Sounds like we're trying to make tracks up to 2100. The so we can see these areas in between the rocks where these fossil corals have landed, and these are sclerotinian corals, cup corals, mostly a, um, a species called Desmophyllum dianthus that uh, lived in this area probably around the last glacial maxima, so about uh, 10 to 20,000 years ago. Um, and probably before that as well. And uh, as these corals have died on these rocks, uh, they get covered over in that uh, ferromanganese crust that we're seeing all over the rocks. Um, and then eventually they break away from the wall. And uh, the reason that we're... Oh, can we zoom in on that orange coral in the center there? Go ahead and come in, video. And the reason that we're so interested in these fossil corals is they can really tell us what's going on uh, in the deep ocean many tens of thousands of years ago. Now this is a different uh, black coral. What uh, what species is this? Storopathies. Yeah, and so this is one of those black corals again, where it has that really distinctive, uh, uh, distinctive black skeleton. Even though the polyps there are orange, you know, we often get told, that, "Hey, this is a black coral," and people are confused because it's not actually black. But uh, these corals can come in oranges and I whites and reds. Um, but the skeleton inside is this really pearlescent protonaceous uh, black color, and that's what gives it its name, so Storopathies, and I think this is the potentially the first instance of that this dive, uh, and actually for this, this cruise so far. Beautiful. Yeah, Scott France is noting in the in the chat room here that uh, this uh, particular skeleton has uh, horns on it, has little spiky parts, um, which you can kind of just see poking through some of the tissue. This you is want to come out partial video. This is a sponge that we're. Okay, let's get it in there. Still trying to get my suit biased out there for my preference. Globe sponge right in front of it, and we actually have one of these uh, swimming polychaetes too, right down in the front. Beautiful. Okay, you can come back in if you'd like. And this is one of those, uh, the polychaete is a swimmer species that we saw yesterday, too. Yeah, and here's this black coral again, the storopathies, with little horns and little spiky parts uh, on the skeleton. Really beautiful. You can just see the tentacles moving there. Pilot's clear, I'll get lasers on it as we come out. Thank you so much, uh, Pilot. No how are we feeling about putting out another ship move? This was rough. Yeah, I think we'll another Scott way. Scott France has noted in the chat room, too, that uh, traditionally for, for corals, both hard That's corals and soft corals, traditionally all of the soft, soft tissue was really kind of scraped away and, and taken over. away, and, and uh, they were described the based on the, on the uh, hard skeleton that was left behind. And as we yeah. learn more That's and good. more, I think that's a sea lily tentacle. I don't think and that's a... Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. um, Bridge, RV, nav. And as we've explored the deep sea more and collected more and more species, we realize that uh, there's a lot of taxonomy that can be done on soft tissues, particularly of corals. And so that's that's becoming much more important, uh, particularly in the advent of genetics as well and being able to get genetic signatures uh, from different samples from all over the globe. Uh, and being able to compare them That's together correct, and uh, and really elucidate some of these unknown families, unknown genus, unknown species.
Irene, is my connection a little better now? Ah, excellent, excellent. So Jason, Jason is uh, at the moment in Maine. Uh, he is co-lead, uh, the geology co-lead, and he is in Maine, and they are seeing the end of Hurricane Elsa go by. So, been having a few connection issues. It's a little damp here. <laughs> Well, thankfully, out here, it's a beautiful day. So it seems like the feature type has yeah, really changed we again. Yeah, I, I, uh, as, as we've gone close to this 2,100 meters, uh, if you look on uh, camera three, uh, live stream three, you can see the map in the top right-hand corner. Um, as those black lines, the contours of the bathymetry get wider apart. That means the slope, uh, the gradient of, of the, the side of the seamount is, is getting lower. And, you know, as that lowers, uh, it's better able to uh, retain and accumulate sediment. So, uh, you know, I think we started to cross over into that lower slope area and underneath the rock, lots of sediment. So uh, I'm not unhappy with that, but. Uh, we may not see as many rocks, and I wonder how long these uh, crinoid forests will continue. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Go ahead and come in, video. I'll bring it into the center. These over here. Yeah. That's yeah, it. that's it. These are some Brasingid sea stars. Oh, actually, no, these are more crinoids. <laughs> there we go. It was worth zooming in. Yeah, these are more crinoids, and I, I these might be slightly different. We did collect one of these red crinoids uh, earlier in the day, sitting on a, a sponge. Um, there's some white crinoids in the foreground here as well. Thank you so much, Pilot. It's sure. great. Pilot's clear with the videos. Just the sheer abundance of crinoids at the site is, is really amazing and fascinating. Come back to center. Copy. Just going to push out to get around this little feature here. Oh, that might be a little pink corallium uh, on the left-hand side, pilot. Left-hand side. Just as we go there, it's really pink coral. We have a quick snap zoom just to confirm that that's a corallium. Yep. Absolutely. No problem, no problem. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. I'll turn lasers on if you want to lead me towards it. Is it to the left? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's just about to come into view. Oh, yeah, I see it. Oop. No, that's fine. I'm just stuck in between a rock and a... It's right there. I just showed it. All right. Go ahead and Copy that. Out. Thank you, Bridge. That ship move is complete. Copy. It's further left. Further left? Yep. Right there? All right, feel free to come in. Let me see it. This guy here? Yeah, we're just confirming that this is a, a corallium, uh, another type of deep sea coral. There we are. And that, I believe, is the first corallium that we've seen today. Thank you so much, Pilot. That's great. Sure. Yeah, that was clear. Although we've seen the corallium on, on our other dives, I think on each of our other dives, that is actually the first time I think we've seen that one today. That's great. It's like palm trees in the background. Mm. More of those uh, cup coral uh, uh, skeletons and other things. We, we just really haven't seen too many of those uh, alive. 
it's really interesting to see so many fossil ones, but no, no. I think maybe one or two we've seen today. Yeah, I have two two written down, two live cup corals that we've seen today compared to these massive piles of these fossilized cup corals. It was obviously um, a much better environment for these cup corals to live and thrive in uh, whenever these were from. And there have been some dates on on some of these uh, cup corals from this area and other parts of the, the corner rise, suggesting they were really thriving during the last glacial maxima, which was over 20,000 years ago. Um, Can we get a look at the coral on the left on the rock? I think that's an Akinella. Yep. Just to the side of the feather star there, Lars. Thank you. Go ahead and come in. There we go. So if I'm correct, this is a bamboo coral that would normally be growing in the sediments. Um, so it's, it's able to create this really interesting, intricate root. It's almost like uh, wax dripping down off of a candle. It has these long move, lobes. But yeah. then when it settles on uh, these this. rocks, you'll yep. see when All we right. look at the base that Bridge it RV creates now. this almost wax dripping like hold yeah, like So this is definitely move, like bamboo coral achenella, probably the species achenella arbuscula. Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. And you can really see those nodes really clearly. Uh, pilot, if you want to just go down to the base and then we can go. That's it. Thank you, Bridge. Thank you. Oh, yeah, look at that. There are those tendrils that Scott was just describing, like wax drippings at the bottom. Beautiful. And you can really clearly see those nodes that make it bamboo coral. So these bamboo corals are called bamboo because their skeleton really looks like bamboo. Again, um, as uh, Scott was mentioning earlier, a lot of these corals uh, at first are really described from their skeletons and not the soft parts. And uh, so these bamboo corals have uh, calcium carbonate uh, white skeleton, and then they have these protonaceous black nodes in between different sections. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much, Pilot. Yeah, that was a fantastic view of the whole class. Thank you. So normally, we don't get to see those roots that clearly because they've filled in. And so what you see is a round disk with sort of like uh, flowing lobes over it. But that was so good that that basically backs up this hypothesis of what we're saying about how they grow between the sediments and the rock. So that was an outstanding close-up. It was really spectacular, really spectacular. Can we continue? Thank you. And of course, before we had the technology that we're using, uh, using today, being able to take uh, cameras down to the seafloor, um, samples from the deep sea were solely collected by either grab samples or small trolls or small dredges uh, bringing up samples. And so we really just had no idea of things like associations of animals living together and uh, species like that Achenella there with that very special base. We would never have been able to collect that base or would have been very lucky to be able to do so. And so it's just amazing to be able to use the tools that we're using today, not only here on the ship being able to see them, but also to be beaming them out to everyone at, at home and to scientists across the globe as well. It does look like we're getting into a much more of a sedimented area uh, with the odd is it pillows that are sticking out? Are those still pillows when they come out like that, or are they called something else, Jason? It's hard to tell now. You know, with so much sediment cover, yeah, you kind of lose the context of um, what's there. What's interesting about them is they're, it, it, the the, the uh, ferromanganese coating doesn't seem to be as complete. There's a lot of a lot of voids and other pieces in it. So I'm wondering, um, you know, given the the kind of uh, wider distribution of sediment we're now seeing, uh, whether they tend to be covered and uncovered over time, we um, this, which may uh, affect, uh, the, you know, how the, uh, the the minerals are actually precipitated. I think you're being outdone this time by a deep-sea hedgehog. 
So this is a I just can't win. Yeah, <laughs> this is a polymastio sponge. Even here in the sediment. <laughs> even here in the sediment. Even here in the sediment. Yeah, this is a polymastio sponge. We've seen a couple of these today. This one's more puffball hedgehog, and we've seen others that looked a little bit more like Copy sea cucumbers or, uh, or or sea slugs, nudibranchs. Copy that. Um, this is a type of deep sea deep sea sponge. Um, they're just uh, amazing. They oh, really do the like little uh, little hedgehogs here. Oh, let's wait a second. Rian, are you yep. able to see on the maps that you have in the control room there um, yeah. how close we are oh, to I... where we start to curve up on our track onto that uh, plateau? Is that why we're seeing more sediment here? Yes, we should be starting to make that curve um, up onto the top. So we should be seeing a change into a more potentially sedimented to, uh, habitat here. So looking on the radar, if you uh, turn to your live screen number three, to, um, uh, you'll be able to see one of those boxes shows you uh, a forward-looking radar, and you can see there's actually a lot of hard returns up ahead as well. So that suggests that there are some rocks maybe in the sediment or even small cliff edges that we will go up here um, as we creep along our track. Watch lead nav. Yeah, the, the, the bathymetry uh, that was connected overnight by the, uh, the mapping team yeah, on the ship what your, uh, hopes uh, are really showed that the, the summit platform has, has morphology on it. It's just not purely flat and, and with no relief there is still a, a lot of yes. relief to be seen and it it, uh, it is kind of a this a representation of what we're seeing now this sediment with um, you know scattered um, you know rock outcrops and ridges and, and and different features so um even though the sediment has certainly uh gotten yeah, that works for um, us. uh more broadly uh, yeah, distributed and appears to be in, in places quite thick and coarse. At approximately the same uh, I did depth, see some some uh, ripple marks developed it, uh, not that long ago. It, uh, there's still some rocks to be seen. Is that a little flat urchin there coming up? You want to do a step two right, on the uh, pancake urchin or flat urchin? All right, I think we're just trying to make it kind of up as far as we can. So another one of these little flat urchins, um, either a hygrosoma or a, um, or a uh, oh, I've forgotten the second one, formosoma, hygrosoma or formosoma. Um, these urchins are really fun. They have little uh, little boots on the ends of their spines on the base there. You can just see they have uh, kind of these white flat boots. Actually, that's beautiful. You can really see the tentacles underneath this urchin, which is what is helping it move along the, the, the surface here. Beautiful. Thank you, pilot. Uh, do we want to put in another ship move? Yeah, I think 15. That's okay, great. great. And are we good with 270? I could also... Is that kind of what's uphill? As right we're crossing yeah, over this up. transition zone into more of a sedimented habitat, we're definitely starting to see... Now. Um, some different different fauna it's now here. Okay time to put in a ship move. Not so many of the fields right, of, of the sea lilies, though I do see some up ahead on some of the rocks. Bearing two seven zero with the speed of decimal two knots. And certainly not as many as the as mu as much of the sponges and and corals that we were seeing before. Copy that. Thank you, Bridge. This is a really interesting rock up ahead with a kind of a depression in the middle. <laughs> it's like a little bowl. Someone's been sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> it probably speaks to the, you know, that we're a little more towards the summit, but the currents up here may be shaping uh, some of these rocks a little more by abrading. Um, maybe even get a little vortex there of mixed sediment and water. It kind of erodes down. Yeah, I, I, I wonder. Uh, kind of the texture of the rocks has changed a little bit. And, um, you know, one thing that we were looking for, and maybe we could take a zoom in on this this edge here, yeah, looks like whether the, there was a transition to a, a limestone cap. Um, so you could and, on the um, you know, video. 
Yeah, it looks like there's some corals yeah, some on the surface too. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Jason. No, it, it, it's all, I think, you know, we, we're seeing different textures and, um, you know, this one seems to be layered. Uh, it's hard to see with this trimanganese crust, um, but That's just the way the, the shape that that rock uh, looked that we passed over. Um, Lasers are on as well. And then I mean, like, look at this, crust, uh, yeah. this, this rock, you know, seems to have these layers uh, slightly uh, diagonal under this, you know, impressive crust. It's a really, really like impressive cusp. <laughs> Look at the size of that. You know that that's uh, that's probably fifty million years of, of of crust accumulation. Wow, that's amazing. With a metallic ordeal right there in front of us. So it's quite possible we changed out of out of a volcanic terrain to a, uh, a sedimentary rock, uh, maybe a limestone, one of these carbonate caps. Hard to see. It's gonna to make us work for it but yeah. um, certainly that change in even the texture of, of the crust makes me think uh, we sort of change right so I hear the word mentioned often um, carbonate cap could you explain a little bit about what that is and, and how we might find it sure so um, you know these seamounts when they do erupt um, are often on on uh, sort of young crust so w when the crust is young it's a little more buoyant it sticks up a little higher uh, and then these seamounts can erupt to the point where they get close to uh, or, or above uh, the sea surface we see that with, with places like Hawaii um, where there are a number of islands ab above uh, copy that. It looks like above sea level also, um, uh, the, the, the volcanoes so that well. create them obviously go down a lot That's deeper cool. to uh, the deep ocean floor. Um, so what happens is when they're up near sea level, you you get a lot of deposition of, of, of uh, limestone, which is essentially, uh, you know, in this case it would be shallow water uh, carbonate uh, secreting organisms, uh, shells and all kinds of things like we see, you know, around the beaches of Florida and, and uh, uh, the Bahamas is uh, these really thick uh, uh, carbonate reef type dominated uh, areas so when these are up high and close to, to uh, you know the ocean surface you can deposit these these limestone caps on top so what happens over time is the crust gets older gets cooler and you get subsidence um, certainly as, as, as the weight of the seamounts uh, increases as well things start to subside um, and eventually when they get old enough they, they get down to the, the tops get down to pretty deep depths so Ooh, um, nice so when we come up uh, on them we, we, we usually start down lower and we're still seeing that volcanic material uh, that was erupted onto yeah, the sea floor tough. and uh, <laughs> but at the top you know there are uh, there is evidence that Certainly for the, the New England seamounts and, and, and a little bit for for the corner ice seamounts that they they do have like this limestone top to them, which, which speaks to a you know a, a very different environment that the summit Copy was that, was at much. previously. Uh, and and what we're looking for is a, a change in in the rock, the texture of the rock, uh, of that little sea star. Um, yeah, a little, little tiny and, uh, sea star tucked in there. A little whitey. <laughs> Along with these crinoids as well. And some brittle stars wrapped around old sponge material there and old coral material as well. Beautiful. Thank you, pilot. Well, it's clear. How much time do I have left on bottom now? Uh, about 15 minutes. 15? Okay. So while we don't uh, we don't have uh, com you know complete evidence of, of, of the change in the rocks, it's, it's certainly uh, circumstantial evidence that we've we've changed to a different rock type. Um, these ferromanganese crusts do a really good job of hiding what's below them. Just That's wanted to chime in real quick. <laughs> Hey, Chris. 
Hey, Rianne. So that sea star you had there, that was very nice. That was a little, it might have been plinth aster, but I've been seeing this sort of more star-shaped form at this depth more frequently. The other thing that was nice about that was that it was actually positioned over that little cluster of light-colored epizoic uh, stuff. So I'm pretty sure that was feeding. Um, I've gotten to the point where I don't see the position of sea stars as being anything coincidental. So um, that's one of the great things about a lot of these observations is sometimes they look fairly innocuous, but uh, they're actually watch. They're op actually observations of predation or other uh, kinds of biology. And um, I'm always happy to see goni asteroids at this depth because they're usually not doing something that we know very much about. Um, that move right. The uh, I see we're good. okay. We're moving back. But yeah, um, there's all sorts of good food here. Lots of just encrusting uh, food and goo. But um, if we uh, I see we're sort of uh, tightening in for the shot again, um, but uh, but yeah, there was a uh, a sort of discolored patch right around right around it, and uh, that was probably some kind of uh, encrusting sponge. Yeah, and, interesting. Uh, these, Feel free to yeah, and if they're something like if it's something like plinth aster or ceramaster, uh, they are voracious predators of sponges, and they can. Um, you know, we saw in the shallower habitats, uh, we saw them um, uh, sort of taking apart one of those large barrel sponges. Yeah, see, there, there's a little sponge under there. Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> as as a starfish person, I've gotten quite good at sort of picking out when you know I see these things humped over other things uh, and. Uh, trying to, to find uh, what they're eating. In the Pacific, we saw all sorts of interesting new um, goniasterids uh, just your, uh, port up uh, sort of hunched over in all sorts of acrobatic positions, trying to devour, um, you know, whatever. I mean, a new starfish feeding on a new sponge. That's pretty typical for uh, a lot of the things that we've seen. The other thing I wanted to point out was that these crinoids, the feather stars that we're seeing, the white ones, you see all of those little white nodes that are on the arms on the bottom? Mm-hmm. Uh, those are gonads. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, yeah, so that's your, up your ballywick. I don't know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know obviously much about crinoid sex beyond Both the fact that they have them. Uh, but um, but uh, we saw the other ones, the other, we, we passed the other white ones a while back with the red ones. So, uh, so yeah, that was a very just wonderful moment of echinoderm biology, which uh, closes out the... I know we're close to the end of the dive. So anyway, sorry, I just wanted to chime in because I rarely get to see a, <laughs> a starfish feeding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, down here, it's it's pretty pretty much your your stuff and sponges. So, uh, but um, you know, if you ever yeah. come across a, a feeding event, do the win-win and uh, get them all. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> thanks, Chris. I appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Uh, you want to do a snap? That might be another logo. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Just after Chris had uh, had uh, signed off here, and he called this a goniaster sea star. Um, so there we are, more than one on this little rock face. Pilot's clear with videos. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll continue. Probably get move in. Do we want to keep going 270, or do we want to, like, make our way up that rock face, or preferences? Uh, either or. I, I think we're just heading heading up. Um, yeah, let's do, like, a 280, if that works with you. All right, let's go about. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. 15 meters, or do you want to cave under here? Hour? Uh, 15. All right. We're seeing up and over. Bridge there. RV nav. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to put in another ship move. We're looking at a range of 1.5 meters, bearing 280 degrees, speed decimal 2 knots. So we come up this cliff, we can see a lot of old sponge skeletons. Roger that. Thank you, Bridge. In amongst all these feather stars, again, the, this 
dive has really been dominated by these feather stars of several different species. Really beautiful. Some on stalks, some on the uh, sitting on the actual rock face. And, uh, there's too many to count in this picture here. And where you saw, see these kind of uh, brown colored structures, those are old skeletons of, uh, of sponges. So when sponges uh, die, their skeleton sticks around for a little bit. It's made of uh, silica spicules that are all knitted together. Uh, and we'll leave these structures on the seafloor for a while after the, the actual tissue, the animal part, dies away. And these can become structure for other organisms too. Just because they're dead doesn't mean they don't continue to form structure in the deep ocean. And so we see a lot of other animals living around them. And in particular, we see these, uh, uh, these brittle stars and these crinoids uh, trying to get up into the current a little bit. And so use these old structures uh, to help them do that. Beautiful, this little pinnacle here. <laughs> And definitely, um, it looks like such a thick ferromanganese crust on this. It, it just seems to have completely covered over all of the structure. And wow, look at this boulder field. And the goal was to get to the 2100 contour line. Is that true? You made it. You're at 28. Yeah, I'm 20 at 2085. You did make it to that contour line, but um, yeah, I think at this point we're just trying to get as far uh, as we can. Yep. Get that. See us see an enemy on a rock there, but really uh, a lot of the fauna seems to be uh, more absent from this area compared to further down the slope. The stalked crinoid there and some sponges, the white sponges sticking up from the. Copy that, thank you. From Rich. these big pillowy lavas. That ship move is complete. Copy that. Looks like upslope, maybe. If you're just joining us, uh, we have about 10 minutes left of this dive. We're on dive six of the NOAA Ocean Exploration Expedition, Go North ahead, Atlantic Rich. Stepping Stones. We're currently diving at Castle Rock, which is a seamount in the northern end of the, the Corner Rise Seamount region. And we're okay? currently at 2,087 yep, meters of water. This. We've had a really great dive today. It's been uh, it's been really exciting to see um, a much more diverse communities than the ones that we visited on the last few uh, few seamounts here. It's been relatively spread out, but we've seen many different species of deep sea corals, from bamboos and black corals. Um, we even saw some solitary cup corals that were alive, as well as uh, a, a lot that that were fossilized uh, fossilized. Uh, we've seen some different sponges as well as some of the same sponges, uh, including the, the spiky hedgehog, the polymastia sponge, which has come up a few times today and it's a, a fun one to find. I think there's another one in front of us. Yep, there's an, uh, yeah, another big one up there. They form such fun shapes. You know, the, one, the first one we found today really did look like a sea slug. And Les Watling in the chat had mentioned uh, a lot earlier that um, uh, these polymastia sponges are often found in the deep uh, Gulf of Maine. Um, we see, uh, I feel like much smaller than that one. That one seems incredibly large. We've seen other species of sponges as well, the sponges on stalks, the euplectelids, as well as some farad sponges. Uh, and of course, we've seen these uh, sea lilies the stalk crinoids and uh, and also the feather stars as well, the crinoids uh, that sit on the rock. 
as well as some sea stars and, and plenty of brittle stars too. So we can snap zoom on the uh, polymast here, and actually the rock to the left of it too would be interesting. Take a quick look at. Yeah, it does. It does kind of look like they've moved back into more volcanic-looking uh, rock morphologies. While we earlier sure, thought we may have seen some some sedimentary rocks, some limestone. Uh, the white dot is a little holdfast that was left behind, but yep, that's a polymastia. And again, one of those stalk crinoids. Coming around. Yeah. They seem to have gotten more uh, ornamental as we've gone up. <laughs> yeah, they certainly seem to be getting larger and larger throughout this dive. Uh, pilot, apparently right in front of us, there is another sea anemone. I okay. didn't quite catch it, the chat yeah, room did. Yeah, you may have Coming to, down. it's not right Oh, right front, there. Right. Yep, that's an actinorus. I see it. Yeah, if we could. Come in on yeah, the they're kind of cool the way they have that different color underneath. Okay, thanks. Yeah, these, uh, these anemones are really distinctive. You can really tell them from that combination of the white uh, on the outside and the red. Very often they're a little darker red than this, actually. This one's a fairly light red one. One second. Um, but this is an actinorous deep sea, uh, deep sea anemone that we often find in, in seamount areas, actually. And that's the first sighting of that particular anemone on this uh, research cruise as well, as well as this dive. Come back in. You can come back in video. Thank you. There we go. Copy that. Thank you. This Bridge. one has a really dark uh, oral area there. Say sometimes the tentacles of these actinorus are much darker than this. This seems quite light, but it definitely has a very dark oral area. It almost looks like it's got an inverted stomach. Um, so uh, anemones and, and corals, they just have the, the one hole, so they take in food, they digest what they can out of it inside, and then they eject whatever is left at the end of their meal. And sometimes they invert their stomach um, to be able to, uh, to get rid of that waste on the inside. So that might be what's going on here. Thank you so much, Pilot. That's great. There is a coral just uh, above this one. It's got kind of a tri, tri horn shape. Okay. Uh, yeah, in the left quadrant of the, the picture. Got that coming over. Looks like a, a clover almost in shape. Go ahead and come in with you. Yeah, and so Scott France has just confirmed this is a Storopathies, this is a black coral. We saw one of these a little bit further down, down the slope. And this is the one with the horny skeleton, has uh, little horns sticking out of it. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Pilot. Interesting skeleton. Can we uh, do a quick snap zoom? On you can do a quick, quick snap zoom as we go. So this looks like one of those kind of elk horn shaped, uh, <laughs> shaped sponges that we've seen throughout this dive. But this is the skeleton. So this is uh, the animal has died away and left behind this uh, silica skeleton. And it's really interesting to kind of see all these nodules and then see all the animals that are living on it too. We see brittle stars and more of these, uh, these crinoids as well. Some of these red crinoids, white crinoids. Actually, if there's a white crinoid at the very base there, we'd like a quick snap zoom. Uh, the base of the sponge, right? The base of the sponge right by the rocks, the very top of the uh, video right now. Go ahead. 
I don't know if it's going to be compliant enough and show us the oral area, whether it's now it's kind of on its side. And these have been really abundant. We've seen a lot of these, uh, these crinoids sitting on rocks today. You can see it waving its arms up in the current, trying to collect food. Beautiful. Thank you so much, pilot. Bathy Pathy's black coral. Got another like minute, minute and a half before you should start setting up. Yep, that. Understood. Looks like watch it. it looks like we have about a minute left on bottom. Is there any final snaps that you'd like to? Yeah, I think if we could snap on the really coarse sediment on the right-hand side. Copy. Go ahead and come in. Oh, the right-hand side, sorry. Uh, either, I mean, there's a patch on the left too, but there's like a big pond of this really coarse sediment here. Be interesting to take a quick look at. Yeah, so Jason, this looks like a mix of those pteropod shells again and, and pieces of coral covered over. Yeah, very much so. Uh, little uh, fragments of the, the ferromanganese crust um, will kind of swept together in these kind of coarse bands. That does happen sometimes when you're, you do have some current flow, you can get this uh, separation of, of the different uh, size and weight materials. It's really quite beautiful when you look you know, at it. Impressive amount. Oh yeah, no. When you see, you know, you can go into some beaches in in more tropical areas. And if you look close enough, you can just see that they're almost entirely made of of uh, these these planktonic organisms. Um, not always pteropods, but um, it. Uh, Probably want to start setting up. You know, it, it is an amazing uh, complexity to these sediments. Excellent. All right, pilot's clear, the video's clear. Thank you so much, pilot. There's a yeah. number of different uh, species of pteropods there uh, as well, so it's not all one. Looks good. Yeah. You see how it's kind of flowing in between the rocks. Definitely not just one okay. one species, uh, all kinds of different shells I'm there. It's really, uh, really starboard. amazing. Coming over. So we've come to the end of come our up. dive today. Yeah, I want to thank everybody who's been um, helping uh, both onshore and on ship today with today's dive. Um, the ROV, ROV crew and team, the video team, um, my co-lead as well as all the scientists on shore. Thank you for watching dive six of the No Ocean Ex Exploration Expedition, North Atlantic Seamounts. Um, stepping stones and we hope okay. to see Delta you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're diving on an unnamed seamount kind of uh, in between here a little bit south of, of this area. So thank you so much. Nice view in fisheye. Thank well, you everyone. Titan ready to go. Tethers nicely to your starboard there. See that? Gotcha. Push it right. Coming up just a little bit, yep. increasing your delta. Coming up as well. Auto heading is engaged. Okay. the ship, pushing out. Happy with that. Max down on my Zeus. Copy. Get your fisheye and tighten. Good copy. Pushing out. And starting to come up. Tether looks good. 